Okay, welcome everyone. Um, we will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Hey, Madam City Clerk, can you do the roll call, please? Councilmember Paul? Here. Council Member Sinks? Here. Council Member Willie? Here. Vice Mayor Chow? Here. Mayor Sharp? Here. Okay, so the first item on our agenda is a presentation by Faria Elementary School Lego Robotics Club fifth graders regarding transportation solutions and managing parking at a busy parking lot. So who do we have here from Faria? You can come up, you can do your presentation. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and the Council Members. Our names are Wani Chanvir, Akriti Merwa, Aishna Chatterjee, Pragati Gupta, and Katherine Cruz. We thank you all for giving us this opportunity to present our project in this meeting. We are part, we are part of a robotic team, and we are all fifth graders in Faria Elementary School. We are a bunch of service-minded and ambitious kids. We look up to you for all your service to our community. This year's topic for the, for the robotic competition is City Shaper, to help shape a better city. Based on this topic, we work on building a robot to perform missions. We also work on identifying a problem in our community, research on ways to address the problem, and come up with a design to solve the problem. We then share our solution with experts and refine the problem, this, refine the solution based on their input. Can you now guess why we are here? We have visited the Crossroads Shopping Center multiple times and we understand that parking has been a challenge, especially during peak hours. We identified this parking lot as one of our subjects of research. We see that this center has roughly 920 parking spaces, catering to nearly 20 shops. We see that there are high demand parking spaces next to shops like Starbucks. Sometimes, the available spaces outside the high demand areas are overlooked. There are times where our parents drive around for a few minutes and leave, not knowing that there are spaces still available. Cars waste gasoline and emit greenhouse gas while going around the parking lot trying to find parking. We looked at the city's climate action plan and we learned that the city feels the same too. We all want to limit the emissions of greenhouse gases. We came up with some practical ideas of how to solve this problem. We realized that 10% of the parking spaces are taken up by employees of this shopping center when they could park outside the high demand areas. We thought of providing and enforcing time limits on high demand lots. And most of all, we want to add signs to help cars find way to the next to the next nearest available parking space. In our classrooms, we raise our hands to be heard. We have seen traditional mailboxes with a lever, when raised up, indicating that there is mail. Why don't we use the same methodology by having a simple mechanism installed next to every parking lot in a high demand area that lifts when the lock, lot is empty and goes down when occupied? Basically, a sign calling for attention like how we do in the classroom. This will help drivers to spot the next available parking lot from a distance, even during peak times, instead of driving helplessly around the lot to find parking. This solution will also help reduce unnecessary greenhouse gas emission in parking lots, thereby promoting climate action plan goals of the city. Please let us know what you think about our idea. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, that is a great idea, and I think the next parking lot to look at is the library, because that is really a difficult problem for our city. So thank you for the presentation, and is that, is that it? Okay, thank you. Nice job. Madam City Clerk, are there any postponements? No postponements, Mr. Mayor. 
Okay, we are on to oral communications. I have three blue cards. If you would like to speak, please fill one out. Give it to the clerk. Um, you're not required to fill one out, but it's appreciated. So we will go in order. I have Jennifer Griffin, followed by Charlene Lee, followed by Genevieve Kolar. So welcome, Jennifer. Um, good evening, City Council. I'm always glad to see um, young, uh, young people learning how to speak very clearly uh, at the City Council meetings. I think that that's a very important uh, thing for them to learn, and they all did a very good job. Um, as an older person <laughs> who speaks at City Council meetings, I just wanted to make a few comments. Um, last week, as you all weren't Oh, we're highly aware there was a power issue across the state with PG&E. Um, Santa Cruz was a real adventure. Power was down for three days. I had relatives that were down for five days. Gas stations were out of gas, et cetera. Um, water, we, we identified at my mother's house that her, they're on well water and the well water was beginning to fail. So a whole new adventure, but I will just make one comment on this. I did not see much, I, I saw no statements from Sacramento, from the politicians in Sacramento, directing what we were supposed to do. The PG&E website was let to crash for three days without anyone pulling in Hewlett Packard or any other high tech company to stabilize it. Um, I, some of my sympathies are with pg and &E. I believe that Sacramento officials need to step up and guide us during these times and make statements to help the state and to stabilize such high capacity. Everyone in California was accessing the pg and &E website and that isn't what's supposed to happen. There was no direction from Sacramento and therefore the website crashed. They should have pulled in backup support in Silicon Valley, we have that support. Um, the other issue is that I wanted to talk about the CASA Compact. Um, I have one minute left. We have a very dangerous precedent setting up with the CASA Compact. If you all weren't aware, this is the direct reason why we had the 14 housing bills. The CASA Compact people met in secret two to three years ago. Many, most of the people on the CASA Compact are unelected. They hold no public office. I don't know how they became involved in CASA, but it, it really sets up a strange precedence here. We have people who are unelected who are making decisions for the rest of the state. Um, at this situation, we need to be very, very wary of what, where we're going with this. I have 14 seconds. Um, SB 50 will be pushed upon us next year. I believe CASA Compact is directing what's happening in Oregon and Washington State and now Texas. We need to bring this group down. They have no right to be making decisions for us in California. They had a secret meeting in New York City December of last year, what were they doing there? How to seize public okay, thank land? Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Next, we have Charlene Lee, followed by Genevieve Kolar, followed by Rahul Vasant. Welcome, Charlene. Hi, my name is Charlene Lee. I got Yale master's degree in 1993. Now I work for a nonprofit organization. Uh, Senator Beck, uh, Senator Beck told me she was being raped by Dear, uh, dear police, because uh, she called uh, internal affair at the Emu Courage Center, then she was be sent to uh, main jail. She was be raped there. I I told uh, mayor of Cupertino and all city council member, uh, Captain uh, Rich Urina had uh, many police, first five police report. Uh, Three, they into my house three times and uh, all of them be dismissed by police because uh, judge, because the judge found uh, they planted uh, evidence. And now Deputy Lord 2232 and Deputy Michael Lett 1933, lie I 
wear uh, white dress, uh, black dress on October 11, 2017, but that day I wear black dress. So uh, please, uh, on purpose, uh, imprinting uh, evidence and lie I wear black, uh, black dress and lie I confess Mantavis High. Now two years pass, uh, Mantavis High and uh, uh, West, West Valley Division haven't provided any evidence photo. So I asked the mayor and the city council member to provide a photo, but they reject. And we need to set up an uh, independent police audit report so the, the woman won't be raped in jail if they can't have internal affairs. That's very important because uh, I was assaulted in the Taiwan Cultural Center because I asked a question in q and section. Police, police, uh, police chief Steve Pagelina falsified police report. That's why I protest in uh, Montavisa High. I only stood there for 10 minutes, they arrest me. But I said, can I leave if I cannot stand there? I, I stood on the front curbside of Montavisa High. That's my right. To, to be a non-profit organization to protest police falsified police report. And then falsified four police, uh, poli police report. So I, I think uh, mayor of Coptino and uh, four city council member cannot reject to put this into agenda. And because uh, Congressman Zhu Gansen said we can put this uh, into agenda if police falsified police report. Also oh. right now, two women, uh, was be raped in main jail. If they contact internal affairs, they will be sent to uh, main jail to be raped. So police should uh, not support in uh, falsified police report and cannot uh, rape a woman. So this is a very serious question. I need a mayor and for city council member to respond to this. Have city, city manager to ask uh, Matavista High to provide uh, October 11, 2017 photo. I wear white dress, that day is my son, Zachary Luz. Okay, uh, please finish day. up, you're out of time. Thank you. Genevieve Kohler, followed by Rahul Vasanth. Welcome, Genevieve. Hi there, um, good evening, Council. My name is Genevieve Kolar, and I represent De Anza College students on the Foothill De Anza Board of Trustees. I came here once before and um, I definitely will be back again and I really hope to have a deeper dialogue with all of you um, beyond just at the city council meetings. So I am now a citizen of, a resident of Sunnyvale. I lived in Cupertino um, for a few months after moving there to continue my education at De Anza. At a certain point, my uh, commute to De Anza from San Jose was over three hours every day, which is not unusual for students. And so I didn't think that I could continue my higher education unless I moved to Cupertino. Unfortunately, my landlord decided to raise our rent and evicted us. And we had a week and a half's notice. So I ended up leaving Cupertino and moving to Sunnyvale. The story is really not unusual. And I'm sure you've heard plenty of alarming statistics about housing, but I wanna bring a particular focus to the struggles of our students, because 56% of De Anza's students are housing insecure, and in the past year, 18% were homeless. That's over 3,000 of our students here in Cupertino. So um, in the coming months, I know next month, people from Foothill De Anza will be presenting here about um, potential developments on our property but beyond that, I really hope to engage with all of you about policies beyond building affordable housing because I know that you have been thinking deeply about that and fighting a lot of different battles, but also about um, more robust transit systems, about ways that we can support renters and support the people who come in here to go to the community college that really enriches Cupertino. So, I mean, thank you for your work so far. Um, we have a huge number of students who are willing to come and advocate with you and learn more about policies and um, help find creative ways together that we can take on the housing crisis. 
um yeah and i'm gonna leave my card here and we'll be back soon and i'll be contacting all of you as well but yeah great Thank and you. i i think okay. this is something we could also put on a future agenda is yeah. something about De Anza students and what we can do about housing we've ha we have had discussions with the chancellor about this mm -hmm. um and things like if seniors are willing to rent rooms to students that are vetted, something like that. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be a good agenda item to look at in the future. Yeah, yeah. and I said, understand the Yanza student get free bus pass. Mm -hmm. Does that not uh, work for students? So maybe that's something we should take a look also. Mm -hmm. Transit options that's inadequate, even with free bus pass. Yeah, that'd be incredible. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, last card I have is Rahul Vasant. Welcome, Rahul. Uh, thank you, Honorable Mayor and uh, Vice Mayor Chow and Council Members. I'm uh, on the Library Commission, but I want to clarify I'm representing and speaking only for myself tonight. At an earlier Council meeting, uh, there is a public comment here I felt that I had to bring up one more time. Uh, one resident had mentioned that he had and his family had lived here for 453 years before uh, crudely telling uh, one of our council members to stop asking questions as for some reason the crowd was not with him. I'd like to just clarify that one of the things that makes our country so wonderful is that someone who gets here and hasn't even been here for 45.3 minutes can walk up and make a public comment. And uh, I also want to bring up the fact that our Vice Mayor uh, Liang Chao, you were elected with the second highest number of votes any, any person in Cupertino has ever received. And if there's a council meeting, uh, say tonight's council meeting, uh, I don't think it'll be tonight, but if this meeting ends at 3 a.m. on Thursday, because many clarification questions had to be asked, a lot of information needed to be brought uh, dur on, during the uh, public record. I think that many of us, I would say the majority of us support you and we would love to see your questions and clarifying questions. It's, it's very important. The next thing that I wanted to say is I'd like to voice my support of our Planning Commission Chair Ray Wong. I have had the opportunity to discuss multiple issues with him. I've found that he engages with the community in a way that uh, is actually quite refreshing. He, right after the election and even before, repeatedly made remarks to get coffee or a beer with anyone and discuss person to person whatever issue was uh, of importance. I think he's a fine planning commissioner and uh, I'd like to, I'm here to voice my support for him. Last thing is I'm actually coming from a school board, uh, or not a school board meeting, but a meeting held by, uh, I think he's a superintendent, uh, Craig Baker. It was uh, quite remarkable to see how strongly aligned the parents of uh, the children in the near, nearby uh, impacted school were all there together asking questions. and. He emphasized a strong need for community engagement, a robust need for a community engagement yeah. process. And I uh, hope you can perhaps discuss this or look into it or have a study session on uh, demographics perhaps in the future. Thank you. Great, thank you, Rahul. Can I ask just one quick question? What was okay. the meeting about that uh, brought so many uh, residents? It was, uh, I mean, I think that uh, Baker had done a really nice job in setting this up promptly at uh, John Muir School. There is, I think, some concern, or actually very legitimate concerns that the school might be shut down due to low enrollment numbers. There's a lot of uh, discussion. Uh, he had mentioned at this meeting that there is no one solution he had in mind. He was gonna look at different options and perhaps a mix of all of them. Some of that was uh, changing the demographics or like making it K through seven or that was one thing. Another thing that I thought was surprising was uh, there's actually a mention of charter schools um, and closing a school I think was something that parents were strongly against but we also had uh, three school board members present at that meeting. 
I think they're actually meeting again right now at Meyer Holds Elementary, and there's a school board meeting on October 24th. Is that it? Okay. Thank you. Okay. We are on to reports by council and staff. This is only for committee assignments. So we can start with John. Do you have anything? So I attended the Legislative Action Committee on the 4th. Uh, Evan Lowe was the speaker. Um, I asked questions about um, him supporting the local control and our uh, decision-making process. I was disappointed that uh, he didn't share the concern. So um, I, I want to pass that along. Um, that was it for uh, committees this week. Great. Thank you, Darcy. Um, as part of my um, duties as the uh, liaison to the sister city committees, I attended the Toyokawa delegation farewell on October 2nd, and it dovetailed nicely with the uh, mayor's duty uh, because as I was um, a little bit late after dropping off my, uh, my daughter to school, the uh, mayor was finishing up with some ceremonial presentations, so I was able to stay for the uh, duration of that uh, farewell uh, ceremony. That was very nice. Um, and then about a week later, on October 10th, the VTA Policy Advisory Committee uh, met, and that was last Thursday. Uh, we had a few substantive discussions, one that may well be of um, relevance to us here in Cupertino, is that we talked about um, a, a set of metrics for determining uh, the awarding of grants for an innovative uh, transit service models. Um, they're having a competitive grant program that um, is tied to Measure B dollars. And Measure B, even though it was passed a number of years ago, was tied up in litigation for a while. And now those dollars are freed up because the litigation is now clear. Um, so uh, one of the metrics we talked about, well, we talked about a number of them, and two of them are, are particularly important. Um, but uh, I, I think overall it was a good discussion. I looked at it from the lens of uh, whether our upcoming Via Shuttles program could uh, potentially uh, apply, and it certainly looks like it can. And I'm hopeful that in addition to the uh, the, the prospective grant money that we um, look like we have coming in from possibly their quality management district, we might be able to get significant support from VTA as well uh, with respect to uh, our upcoming shuttle program. Uh, another item that we talked about over at the PAC was an express bus partnership program. And uh, for those who are un unaware, uh, VTA runs a number of express buses that go somewhat longer distances. Uh, they're not particularly um, highly occupied, uh, much like a lot of the VTA buses. Um, right now, the average cost for a non-express bus per rider is approximately $8 and some change. Uh, for an express bus ride, um, unfortunately, that number uh, goes all the way up to $35 and some change. And so. Uh, when we're talking about a program that costs about $10 million a year, um, it is actually pretty expensive, but um, it is a good um, mechanism for getting people a little bit of a further distance, say from Gilroy to their place of employment in, uh, in Mountain View. And so part of what they're trying to do here is to uh, partner with private entities to see if they can perhaps um, alleviate some of the costs to the taxpayers. Um, but I think that part of what VTA was doing in this exercise was trying to get some input from the various cities of Santa Clara County. And, um, you know, part of the discussion was, you know, for this express bus program, could we perhaps um, think about other, you know, if we're talking about innovative transit, um, uh, other potential ways of uh, looking at the money, um, you know, encouraging carpooling, you know, if, if you're going every day on this express bus, uh, you're, you're spending some thousand dollars of taxpayer money, and, and that really goes quite a, uh, quite a ways to, um, you know, other alternative sources of transit. So um, it was a good set of discussions, and um, that was it for my committee assignments for this past two weeks. Great. Council Member Sinks. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, when VTA put in an express bus on 85, and we'd, we'd ask them to do that as a temporary measure, Unfortunately, they started in Gilroy. They went to the Gilroy station. This is the, the 185 that's now defunct. They went to the Morgan Hill station, and then they came all the way up the 85 corridor, past the vast number of houses in, in the Almaden Valley, 
and didn't stop in Cupertino. They went just directly to Mountain View and then ran a local service to employers. It's no wonder that that was the the bus with the lowest ridership. I mean, because frankly, it, it's redundant with a Caltrain service. So I think there, there are certainly express bus r routes that might be merited, but uh, that, w that was just nuts. Um, so uh, as you mentioned, um, our innovative new uh, shuttle program, I'm happy to announce that on the 24th of this month, uh, the the subcommittee called the Mobile Source Committee of the Air District, of which I'm a member, will be voting on $420,000 grant uh, to help offset the cost of our program. And uh, I'd, I'd like to commend staff on the really fast turnaround, getting that application in and, and getting it through uh, that grant process. It must have happened. It you could count the number of weeks on, on one hand, I think. So congratulations to staff for that. And, uh, I can't tell you how I'm going to vote on that, but <laughs> so <clears throat> um, I'll be I'll be delighted to be at the meeting at least. Oh, um, you don't need to recuse for that. No, no. Oh, that's good. <laughs> no, uh, you know, and and we'll be granting to a whole number of uh, different innovative transit programs of the which the staff at the Air District must have felt this was a strong application to award this much money. So I, I'm delighted by that. Um, I was at the Cities Association uh, last week and on Thursday, and several things went down there. Um, so VTA came and presented the VTA Independent uh, Review Committee, uh, folks that VTA has hired as a consultant to come in and look at transit models. I really, you know, V VTA decided to do their own study, hiring their own consultants to tell them what they'd like to have them tell them, I guess. But uh, uh, so VTA did not look f further than their own consultants to, to do this. So there was uh, there were a few people that um, at the Cities Association meeting that uh, expressed some dissatisfaction, at least uh, privately around the table. Um, and I will say that. Um, Several people, I, I among them, urged them really to look at the letters that cities had already sent back on reporting the grand jury, and this seemed to be a new idea for the consultant. And talking about different governance models beyond just a board tweak or two. Um, and so um, they, 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 the consultants, of course, do what consultants do. They took that feedback. and. Uh, We'll see what happens. Jason Baker also showed up to present Faster Bay Area, our potential nine-county regional transportation measure that would charge all of us 1% as a sales tax um, and be put on the November 2020 ballot. Um, I know there's been a, a fair amount of consternation by electeds about this. There was no real discussion or meet our substance on um, how the projects would be uh, determined. Um, so the presentation was interesting, but didn't really have a lot of substance. And as soon as I get the slides, which we asked for, um, I will pass them on to all of you. And I'm sure we'll be hearing uh, more about this. Then finally, uh, at the same meeting, there was a, a lot of discussion about the Rena subregion. Um, and in the end, uh, there was support uh, for doing what we had recommended, which is the regional collaborative, at least putting that out. Most cities hadn't actually weighed on this in the last month based on the new information, but the idea is to go to each city and, and say, you know, uh, up to X dollars, I think it was $5,000 to, to get going on uh, participating in this. So I expect uh, on our consent calendar soon enough will be the formal language that would have us participate in this collaborative. But what's off the table is any kind of formal arena subregion. So, and that's it. Great, thank you. Vice Mayor. Um, for the official function, just as Toyokawa that I attended, uh, um, the rest I'll report at the end. Mm. Yeah, I also attended Toyokawa, and yeah, for the rest, I'll wait until the end of the meeting. 
So we are on to the consent calendar. Um, did any member of the council or any member of the public wish to pull anything from consent? So one member of the public emailed that she would like to pull Linda Vista Trail item. Okay. She won't yeah, be able to be attended. Right, and I have another person okay. pulling that as well. Okay. Um, so, um, so besides item 12, can I get a motion for the other items? I'll move uh, two through 13, three. accepting 12. That's three through three. Three, three through. And I'll also three through 13. Okay, vote with your lights. Actually, uh, sorry, item 13, I hope to have a staff report. Um, could I? Okay, so let's cancel that vote and um, can we have a motion for everything except 12 and 13? Okay. Rod, you want to redo your motion? Sure. Uh, three through... 11 then. A uh, second. Okay. <clears throat> okay, vote. Okay, so. The motion I, carries unanimously. Okay. Item 12, um, I have one card, Kitty Moore. Is Kitty here? Okay. Ready to start? Okay. Yes. Um, good evening. Um, I was given this uh, letter regarding the Linda Vista Trail, um, and there's some concerns that there originally there wasn't a map of the general area and the map of the specific parcels. Um, when I look at the agreement, there are some easements. Um, which I don't see plotted, and I have some concerns about what the land rights are for those easement holders. Um, I'm also concerned with the statement that every person trying to understand this agenda item had to go to the Santa Clara County's assessor's website to find the parcel. I believe that would be before this agenda item uh, came up. So if people wanted to know about uh, the allocation of funds for this project um, previously, they would have need to, needed to do some research on their own. Um, and then looking down at item C, did the city council knowingly approve funds for the trail before approving the donation? This seems like the cart before the horse. I do think that that is a, a valid question. Okay, so the easements I'm referring to are parcel two and parcel three, which I did not have time to plot myself. Um, they look like the parcel two looks like it's about 60 feet wide, 374 feet long for public utilities, and parcel three also for public utilities. Um, my concern about that. Is, is that if you don't have those actual um, documents, you, there might be some limitations that you have um, for creating the trail. So I would like to know if that was um, looked into. Um, because it, it, there is a possibility that something has been given to the city that perhaps you don't have um, full rights to. Okay, thank you. Great, so can staff answer the concerns of um, the speaker? Um, I'll do what I can here without having all of the necessary information in front of me. Um, the first question regarding um, you know, maps to locate the property, there are maps that were provided uh, in the agreement. Uh, at the end of the agreement, exhibits B and C, there was a, a GIS map as well as an aerial map to kind of locate those properties. Additionally, there, were, there was a legal description at the end of that agreement, which is um, uh, a legally 
defensible description of the property. So um, with respect to no maps being provided, they were included in the agreement, which was an attachment to the staff report. Um, additionally, um, funds were allocated for this project uh, back in July 16, uh, 2019 with the amended CIP budget. Um, all of this work, the, the donation agreement uh, is all part <coughs> of the project that was approved with those funds um, and is consistent with that. Um, with respect to the easement documents, a title report has been provided for the property. There are a number of easements on there, some of them PG&E. There are existing PG&E overhead lines in there for anybody who's been out there to, to, to look at those. Um, and they're all public easements which are um, typically underneath every street anyway. Uh, we work around these and we work to coordinate any, any uh, facilities that would need to be relocated. At this point in time, no facilities are anticipated to be relocated. And uh, I mean, I'm not sure what else or any other specific questions that may be coming up with respect to those. So, so the budget, the, yeah. there will be a budget to, yeah. to develop the trail though, right? Correct. After yeah. we, we're gonna have the donation, then we're gonna have to, but no. the money's. Money is already okay, allocated. How, July 16th. How, um, how much was that? It was a $595,000 request in the staff report and during council discussion. Another 20K was added to do some due uh, to, to look the into cross crossing. Cross the crossing. Oh, the crosswalk of McClellan. For a right. total okay. budget of 615.5. I see. Okay. So, oh, thank you. We received um, the public residence email, I think the one that uh, the same one PT Kitty was referring to. So, Peggy Griffin, she asked um, how come. What, what will be the cost of all the staff to pr do the title agreement uh, to process the uh, donation? It seems that cost was not uh, included uh, because at the end of the staff report that says there is no fiscal impact, um, saying because the cost has been allocated. Uh, so, but and another issue she raised was the donation was conditioned on the city put in money to develop the trail by the end of the year. And that was not clearly specified in the staff report. So she was confused about that. Can we spread, uh, clarify what's the condition of this donation? Yeah, I can provide some clarity on that. Uh, originally, um, with a, an earlier letter of understanding uh, between Richard Lowenthal and the city, uh, it, was a, it was the letter of understanding basically stated that we would work to try and get this project uh, approved and funded by the end of 2019. Um, the, the project has been funded and with respect to this donation agreement which, which would then uh, result in the actual agreement to donate this land, uh, we did not put a date in there which, would provi which provides the city some flexibility in trying to get uh, a contract in place. Um, so the, that date to establish things by the end of 2019 is no longer uh, a valid date for this donation agreement. Um, Mr. Lowenthal can pull out of this agreement, um, you know, based on the city not moving a project forward. So we are continuing to move this project forward in an expeditious manner, but we've not, we're not stuck with the deadline at this point in time. Um, the other question from uh, Ms. Griffin was, um, the cost of uh, processing the donations. I suppose it's yeah. minimal, but then there is a cost. So uh, the, the cost of processing is all part of the uh, budgeted amount. We're anticipating at most twenty dollars to $25,000. That would be if an ALTA survey is required. Um, we have some surveying work that's already been performed and would be kind of incorporated into this work. Mm -hmm. um, but it's all been considered with the cost of the project. Yeah. So thank you. I think the main thing is um, let's be clear about the history of the project in the staff report so that the public uh, who didn't attend the July 16th meeting will understand the background, why we are allocating the money, why it has to be this year, and that, that will be really helpful. And also I think it might not be entirely accurate to say there is no fiscal impact because the condition of the donation is to construct the trail. 
So maybe just say here is what we have allocated to. Don't say there is no fiscal impact. That's also confusing. Yeah. I think the, ter the term of no fiscal impact pertained to the actual literal action council would take today. Yeah, I think would maybe more accurate is no additional for funds this are requested. I think the staff report also said no additional funds will be requested uh, with this item, which is accurate. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I would like to move this item, 12. Yeah. Sure, I'll second that. Okay. Oh. Motion carries right. unanimously. Okay, item 13. Um, <coughs> Vice Mayor, so you pulled this, so. Okay. Wow. Yeah, I understand from Roger, this is a very complex um, task that um, I initially, when I read that, I thought, well, why would we need $250,000 to hire a consultant to figure out the rate structure for, um, for garbage disposal? And, but then he really spent a lot of time, and he will try to g get the city a really good deal, <laughs> hopefully figure out how best to save us money through the consultant. So I hope that he can explain that so we don't have public coming back <laughs> again on this, yeah. Okay, so someone wanna move this item? Uh, can you explain why, oh, what, okay. what's the work involved that we will need a consultant to do this? Uh, Yes, yes, I can do that. Uh, good evening, Mayor, members of Council, Roger Lee, Director of Public Works. So what, what this master agreement will do is help prepare us for, for really two um, large agreements that we have. One is for our franchise uh, waste agreement that we have with Recology now. That is sunsetting in uh, at the end of January in 2021. And then with our um, landfill agreement we have with Newby Island, that expires in November of, of uh, 2023. And so we have a lot of choices and opportunities as to how the city's solid waste, um, you know, garbage, recyclables, organics, uh, could be collected and, and diverted from the landfill in the future. Um, so what, what the services that would be provided by this agreement would, would look at different studies that we've already completed. Um, we've done various waste characterization studies, waste audits. Uh, we've been talking with uh, the city of Sunnyvale and, and the SMART station. You've, uh, many of you have attended some of those earlier uh, study sessions on that. Um, so it's, it, it's really knowing um, and also doing a, a rate study to make sure that uh, the cost to provide the services match up with the, uh, the, the cost to, uh, to provide them. Uh, so what this agreement does is just help us get, well, get in advance of these agreements that are expiring and making the right decisions because we currently enjoy some very low rates uh, relative to our other, other neighbors and a high level of services. So we're just wanting to continue to do that and yet meet all of our regulatory requirements. Okay, um, Jennifer, did you have a on this item? Oh, okay, come on. welcome. Um, good evening, City Council. I wasn't um, going to speak on this, but I, it's always interesting. <laughs> I'm glad you all brought this up, the Vice Mayor did. Um, I was just gonna make a comment. Um, I'm assuming we've had Los Altos garbage for many, many years, Recology, and I, I think they're doing a great job, so I, I put my vote in for them to continue with them. My experience with my friend who lived in Sunnyvale for many, many years in her family home um, is that Sunnyvale has a very complicated way that you pay your city services. You pay your garbage bill to the city, which is rather strange, and then you pay, I think you pay your PG&E bill to the city. They have like a combined um, you, you <clears throat> pay a lot of things to the city, which we pay separately. And I will tell you, I, I spent a lot of time with her when she was moving uh, several years ago from the family home. I was not really impressed with the garbage setup that, that Sunnyvale was using. They had a, their toter that was for recyclable had a, it's a large toter, and it had a, like a compartment down the middle, and it, you had two separate sections, and we couldn't get anything in there. It was, it was set up very poorly, 
and it, I don't think it was very efficient. Um, it was a lot of wasted space. So I would strongly look at, uh, you know, before we go off deviating from Los Altos garbage to go hand in hand into the sunset with Sunnyvale, I wasn't really impressed with Sunnyvale's uh, garbage services. I'm not sure who's providing them, but that uh, waste that I guess this was their recyclable cart, having that compartment stuck in the middle of it, you couldn't get anything in it. And we were trying to um, shut the house down and move uh, family members out of it. We couldn't get anything in that cart. It was impossible. Um, so if they're, if they're I, I, I'm going to just say, as someone who is home a lot as a homemaker, I see things that are done for, quote, efficiency. And it's like maybe you have one cart. But when the reality is, if you're trying to put things in there, it, it just doesn't work. So that's why I think we need to have, I, I, I'm sure Sunnyvale has a real, it's a great city. But I was not really impressed with that recycle cart they had. It, it was hard to use. Um, seniors couldn't move it. It was just impossible. Anyway, thank you. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Okay. So, um, Roger. Yeah, and, and that's an example of some of the considerations. You, you, an agency can spend quite a bit of money uh, up front to have special trucks and containers to, to sort waste out from the resident side, or you could choose to go and, and have containers similar to what we have and have it sorted out on the, on the end of the line. And so those are the types of things that we would be considering here. So the uh, separated uh, tr uh, garbage can with two compartments could be one of the options that they are studying. Well, we'll yeah, we'll um, look at it. I mentioned the waste characterization study that we did. Well, we re you really need to know what, how your waste, what, how it's comprised to know what recycling opportunities there are. Mm -hmm. And then look at what our diversion rates are now to see what more you could get, what the cost would be to get that. Um, but yeah, these split carts, they have the, the fiber on one side and containers on the other, garbage on one side, or food organics on the other. Uh, it's very expensive up front, but we'd be looking at all those things. So it's very expensive up front, but it might have savings uh, down the line, and so they well, will it, evaluate that. Yeah, it, it could, um, but many of you are aware of a changing regu regulatory environment. Uh, commodity markets are, are moving. You know, uh, what was recyclable one year is now costly right. and you have to pay to get rid of it this year so all those things are rolled into what we're looking at so i think with the split carts they have to roll out less trucks per house because now we're getting three separate trucks coming to our house but with the split cart there must be a special truck that it's dumps, a split, yeah yeah it's a split truck right, right it's a split truck as well and i'll yeah. say yeah. that the item for consideration right is it's, just yeah thank you sorry contract. so yeah. Um, so if residents have concerns about or suggestions about what options the consultants should study, they should email the city? Who should well, they? Yeah, we, I mean, we'd like that input. We'll, we'll definitely mm -hmm. be involving Oh, the, would there be an outreach about this? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there could be some pilot programs that occur. Um, the Sustainability Commission has been engaged on this topic. I, I, I can see us having some study sessions with council as well. Um, because this is uh, some of the largest uh, contracts that the city administers. Right. Hey, council Member Paul, you had some okay. questions? Great. Thanks, Mayor. Um, so I noticed that the, um, the other party to this agreement uh, being proposed is H and F and H consultants. And um, if a member of the public wanted to get a sense of uh, how this uh, consultant was selected, how would they go about you know, finding out if there was a bidding process and what the you know, results of uh, that process happened to be, if any? Uh, yeah, they, they contact myself at Public Works, and um, we, we did go through a, a, a request for qualifications and interviews and then selected HF&H. &H. And we've had some experience with them in the past as well, but they're, they're on our current qualified list. Okay, great. And when was this uh, RFQ uh, conducted? Yeah. Was this a while back? or? or well, usually we, we keep our list active for two years. I don't know the exact date, though, uh, Councilman Paul. I see. So what happened was that they were, they were interviewed uh, at a point in the past, and they were placed on a list, and then more recently it was just a selection off of this list. That's that correct. Occurred. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it would be nice to get a little bit of transparency. I mean, this, this particular item is... Uh, indeed about an allocation uh, and entering into agreement for an allocation that's already been made. So we're not actually authorizing the $250,000 here. That's already been allocated in the budget. But I think 
um, it, it's fair to ask about the uh, consultancy selection and right. just give the public a, a general sense of, because you know this really represents quite a bit of our budget. Uh, public works is um, you know a, a lot of you know what runs the city, and to uh, let members of the public know how these dollars are being spent, um, it's instructive, for instance, to know that this wasn't necessarily something that happened recently in terms of identifying this particular company, uh, and that in fact Cupertino has a process and it has a list that it has for various types of you know yeah. consultancy uh, yeah. agreements. Uh, the city attorney, um, she helped point me to the, to the staff report. Um, we're June 20th of this year is when we established that new list. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So if a member of the public wanted to go to the June 20th um, uh, meeting materials, then we would be able to uh, pull that? Is that, is that correct well, or is it? Yeah, we would have the documents in, in public works and we could share those. I see, I yes. see. So if a member of the public wanted to identify a particular date um, and um, go to staff, and say, look, I want to know the information behind the June 20th, 2019 um, identification of particular vendors. Uh, please give me, you know, what you have. Then that would be able to. You yes. Know, be yeah, we'd have the request for qualifications that went out, the responses received, and the selection process of how we determined HF and H. Okay, great. I uh, yeah. really appreciate the responsiveness, and maybe just, Sorry. you know, just for the sake of uh, transparency, my only comment would be, um, maybe if that could be made accessible uh, through our our city records and website. You know that that kind of generalized overview at the very least. Yeah, we, we um, probably have it on the on our on our website for uh, prior closed, maybe like clo a closed bid. Sure. And yeah. So because sure. those are advertised on there. Yeah, just kind of a superstructural, you know, uh, information to the public. How does this, you know, how does this happen? I know it's not in our in our annual budget, right? right. For instance, um, and it's, and public works doesn't necessarily have a whole lot of, you know, um, well, it doesn't ha have a particular section on our city website, for instance. Yeah. But um, you know, it's uh, yeah. a good instructive uh, follow-up. If um, you know staff wanted to create kind of a one-page summary as to how these types of you know consultancies mm -hmm. are are selected um, as an addendum to the post-meeting materials, I'm sure that it would be appreciated by members of the yeah, public. That, that would, would like be to, really helpful. Right. Okay, thanks and very much. I have yes. one question. Um, what this says, master agreement. As I understand, this is different from a specific contract to a consultant with a specific scope of work. Master agreement is a different type. Could you explain what's the difference? Right, so in a master agreement, we, we identify an overall budget to, to um, complete a wide range of, of anticipated services. And those services may come to fruition or they may not. And then we'll, like we wanna do a rate study. And so, um, and that'll be part of the overall um, budgeted amount that's being asked here, or it may be to uh, help us prepare the request for qualifications for the next franchise agreement. So we can do the rate study first at a finite amount, and that's one specific service agreement under the master agreement. <clears throat> and then when that's complete, we then will then say, well, we want to start doing the uh, request to, or to prepare the um, request for qualifications for a new franchise agreement. And that'll be another dollar amount. So it really, we, we can just break up the, the master amount of, of, of what's being requested this evening into different sub discrete parts and just work on those separately. Um, and it just gives us good flexibility because we've already got the insurance is already set up. Um, the agreement is set up and we can just, uh, it's flexible. We can just activate one at a time. So then the cost for each of these sub project will be determined uh, between staff and the consultant, and it will come back to the council. Th that, that's right, and, uh, and up to the, the amount that's up being authorized. Up to the amount uh, that's uh, authorized here. That's correct. And, but you, and you don't have a specific list for this kind of master agreement. This is usually for like a specific period of time, ending Jan January 31st, 2022. And the uh, staff will decide as needed. Just that's trying to understand the process. Yeah, that, that's, that's correct. And, and, and we gave you a flavor in the staff report of, the, of what specific type of services that this uh, consultant would provide. That's right. I was just gonna say, and usually each individual project is below the threshold that would need to come back to council, but we wanted to bring the entire master agreement to council since the total cost might reach the amount that would require council authorization. That's right. So one quick question <coughs> or uh, request. So I do like the uh, uh, ability to be transparent and have residents 
quickly find the information like on the selection process. Unfortunately, when we say, well, it's probably uh, on the website somewhere, I think trying to navigate the website and locate the information is probably going to um, uh, uh, cause people to abandon their, their uh, interest. What I would ask, and so maybe, Mary, you can make a comment, if we're talking about a particular topic, whether it's Linda Vista or this uh, uh, contract, when we do have that information on the website with links, can we have those links put so that when you know, the residents are watching, they, they can quickly see that uh, this is the agenda for tonight and this information can be found at this link. So it's not for us, it's for the residents, but again, for them to hear us deliberating, uh, deliberating on something and they have questions and then have to go and try and locate and navigate to it as opposed to there's the link, um, maybe it's got a couple links and they can go, they can find how the consultant was picked, who, who else was considered, um, things of that nature, I think would really help the residents to be more part of this process. Well, isn't, isn't that all in the staff report? I mean, there was a discussion about how we got to where we are here. I mean, that, that I read, I didn't really have any comments because I read it and accepted it, but uh, you know. Right, That's there's where already we get our link. information from. We there don't is need a link, in the, link in the agenda already, and the there is a link in the agenda to the staff report. But I think John mm. is referring to maybe in the staff report we can provide hyperlink right. to how the consultant, uh, Bingo. Uh, like consultant selection process, and for example, what's master agreement? This kind of contracting. Because I asked similar question earlier, mm -hmm. I'm asking again because I thought public might need to know, but if we have hyperlink in the staff report in the future, we can just say, follow that hyperlink. We usually don't have hyperlink in our staff report. So maybe that would be helpful. Come on terms, come on process as CTUs. I mean, I mean, that's fine as long as we're not adding full-time employees to do <laughs> this kind of thing, because it, it does take time to do that. Well, it's just linking documents and, and to give some specificity to it. On page two of the staff report, the second paragraph uh, starts anticipating the need for these consulting services. Staff completed a request for a qualifications process on June 20th, 2019 in accordance with state and city codes. And so I think what the request basically is, is saying, well, could we have access to, and I think this is all, this should be publicly available information. There's nothing confidential about it. Could we have ap access to the applications that came in as a result of the RFQ, can we take a look at the RFQ and can we see the qualifications and the applications of the two that were selected? I, I think that's something that does take extra staff time, true, but it's something that also um, uh, the public would really like to be able to, to see and um, there certainly is a lot of added um, uh, accountability with regard to the process, but not just the accountability aspect of it, but um, the idea that the um, the whole thing becomes a lot more clear, right? So the, the public doesn't just think, well, that's $250,000, what precisely is it that they're being asked to do? And um, I don't have to just kind of take at face value the idea that this particular consultant out of the two that were qualified was chosen because they're clearly more, you know, uh, you, you know, uh, they're, they're clearly more qualified in this particular area. It, it, their application itself makes it very clear. So, you know, I, I think it's, you know, if it's if it's really onerous, and I don't understand why it would necessarily be, um, I, I can see why you know we would kind of hesitate to do it. But if it's just a matter of kind of uh, linking within the do document to another source where you could actually find those underlying uh, materials, you know, I'd be all in support of that. So, thanks. Um, I'll bring a motion uh, that we um, uh, approve consent item number thirteen. All second. Okay, vote. Motion carries unanimously. Wonderful. Hey, we are on to public hearings. Um, the f only public hearing item, amendment to Title 16, Buildings and Construction of the Cupertino Municipal Code, adopting the California Building Standards Code and Fire Code as mandated by the State of California, making local exceptions to these standards as warranted. 
Oh, can we have a staff report? Yes, we, you have a staff report and we'll have a presentation for you shortly Great. as well. Uh, Honorable Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members, mine's Ben Fu, Director of Community Development. Uh, today, this item we bring forth for you to consider the adoption of um, Chapter 16 in our Muni Code, updating the uh, Building Code as well as the Fire Code. Um, the, these are our triannual updates as mandated by the State of California. Within it, there are also some local exceptions that we have uh, proposed as well for adoption. All these were uh, reviewed, um, developed, and um, uh, endorsed by the tri -chop chapter Uniform Code Committee, which consists of all the Bay Area uh, building officials, as well as our, our, our county fire marshal, marshals and um, um, uh, chiefs association. So um, with that, I would like to introduce uh, El Salvador. Albert is our uh, building official and assistant director of our departments, and we have Sean Hatch, our deputy building official here to present uh, you a little bit more details on these significant changes. Thank you. Albert? You just stole my thunder, Ben, but um, so, so, so yes, as Ben said, we're here to present the state mandated code adoption of the 2019 triennial edition of the California Code of Regulations. Um, hopefully our short presentation will help you understand why we're going through this every three years. Um, we have Sean Hatch, as Ben said, he's deputy building official, to present some of the highlighted uh, amendments to our California codes. We also have Julie Linney here present, uh, pr present to answer any questions uh, if you have any regarding the fire code standards. So with that, the code adoption process is, um, might seem like a lot to wrap your hands around, but Actually, it's really quite simple. All the amendments we're gonna to present to you tonight has been vetted through committees, discussed, and really every jurisdiction, almost every jurisdiction in this area are uh, adopting this similar standards. So I want to present to you what this ordinance does not involve. We also want to define what Title 24 is. We'll also take a look at uh, some of the timelines for the adoption of our building standards codes for both the state code and the as well as local amendments and lastly Sean will will highlight as I said several several changes to um, our local amendments all right so first of all what uh, is this what what is the ordinance how am I going to say? This? Sorry. What is ordinance is not involved? <laughs> <All right. laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> I just want to point out what this process does not involve. This code adoption is not part of the REACH code efforts that will be presented to you next month. Um, and also, uh, amendments to the Cal Green codes are not part of this code adoption ordinance. Our sustainability group is currently working with a consultant to schedule public outreach. Uh, to vet out recommendations that Cupertino can support before it's presented to you, to City Council. Um, actually, if the public wants to know more about our code reach efforts, Cupertino Sustainability Man Manager Andre uh, Dravort is here tonight, and he will be facilitating a reach code workshop to present goals and objectives for this effort, which will be held actually here in this room tomorrow night from six to eight, as it says. All right, so what is Title 24? Title 24, California Code Building Standards, is a broad set of requirements for construction and maintenance, fire and life safety, and accessibility that apply to structural, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems for all buildings and structures in California. And these codes are made up of 12 parts as listed here. I don't need to read through all of them. So the, the codes, um, the California codes, are actually based on nationwide codes. Uh, the international codes, uh, the, the building and fire code is based on international codes. The uniform uh, code is, is, is what the plumbing and electrical, sorry, it's the plumbing and mechanical code. Uh, what, what that's based on, and the national code is what the electrical, California electrical code is based on. 
So why is Cupertino required to adopt Title 24? Uh, actually, it's state mandated health and safety code 18941.5 requires that all amendments, additions, and deletions become effective 180 days after the publication of the California Code of Regulations and health and safety code 13869 allows for the adoption of the building standards related to fire safety. So the timing of this presentation falls in line with the adoption of our state codes since our local amendments are required to be effective 180 days after the publication of Title 24. So here's a timeline. Um, the timeline the state codes are under. Title 24 was published July 1st, 2019, and 180 days after publication, um, Title 24 is adopted January 1st, 2020. So that means our local amendments have to fall within the same timeline, so we're here today, October 15th, um, 2019, for our first hearing. Our second hearing will be held on November 5th, next month which will give us about, well, seven weeks almost. So uh, our codes become eff effective 30 days after approval by city council, but once our ordinance is approved, we have to send that back up to the state, back up to the California Building Standards Commission for review and approval. So we're giving them about seven weeks or so for them to review our ordinance and approve it hopefully in time for the January 1st, 2020 date. All right. Um, the California codes, the, um, our, the approval of our local amendments comes with a couple caveats. One, our local amendments are not allowed to be less restrictive than the California codes. And two, all amendments, additions, and deletions to the building standards shall be justified to be necessary to address geological, topographical, and climactic conditions. So because of that, our amendments are based on recommendations from the local chapter uniform, um, it's actually the Tri-Chapter Uniform Code Committee, and the Santa Clara County Fire Department. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Sean, who will highlight um, several changes made to our local amendments. Hello, Mayor, Vice Mayor. Hello. City Council, uh, I'm here to address a uh, we have four items that I'm gonna highlight this evening uh, that we are recommending to add, delete, and modify for this code cycle. Uh, the first item uh, is to establish a scope and administration relating to the building construction within Cupertino. Uh, as you've noticed uh, in our draft ordinance, uh, this is the one section that has a significant amount of additions. Uh, the reason for that is the state of California adopts a few of them and then leaves a majority of them up to the local jurisdictions to adopt and it's certain items such as you know establishing the duties and powers of the building official uh, permit requirements uh, including work that's exempt from permits information needed on permit applications and kind of permit time limitations uh, it also includes submittal documents uh, required at submittal uh, basic inspection requirements, uh, information to be included on a certificate of occupancy, uh, establishment of a board of appeals, and procedures for stop work orders, items like that. There's several more, you can see that in the, the draft ordinance. Um, the second one is, uh, this is one that deals with the, go ahead. Uh, the second item is limiting materials used in the construction of braced wall panels uh, that are used in using conventional light framing provisions of the code. And so because we live in kind of a high seismic area, the tri-chapter has uh, recommended that we don't allow the use of gypsum board, structural fiber board, hardboard panel, and particle board when constructing these 
these braced well panels, right? And so, and that's, <clears throat> sorry, that's there on that, that slide there. Uh, the third one is uh, um, they, this code cycle, they've added an exception uh, to the residential code that allows the removal of emergency escape and rescue openings from bedrooms and basements, um, which we weren't, you know, after discussion with our friends at the fire department, we've, uh, we didn't feel very comfortable with that in case there was a fire and somebody was trapped in their bedroom in the basement, they wouldn't be able to escape. Um, and so we're recommending that as one of the, the changes. And then the fourth one uh, is our fire sprinkler requirements for residential buildings. Um, and we've, we've uh, this has been in previous municipal codes, but this time we've kind of taken the opportunity to clean it up a little bit to make it a little more understandable for the users. Uh, and we wanted to add, with all the talk about the accessory dwelling units and, and that being a focus too, we wanted to add kind of the state uh, changes for that as well. So if you, you look at this, it's, there's five items on there and the first three are, are, are pretty straightforward. It's really the uh, fourth item, which establishes uh, requirements for additions uh, to existing single family residences, uh, kind of gives a a size limitation uh, for when it's triggered that fire sprinklers will be required. Uh, and then the fifth one is the one that pertains kind of in line with the state uh, about uh, accessory dwelling units. Um, so we worked with the fire department and uh, have come up with, with these, if you meet these four items that uh, your detached accessory dwelling unit in your backyard can be exempt from needing fire sprinklers. Um, and so the first one, you know, is, is the uh, existing primary residence doesn't have fire sprinklers. The second one is uh, that it doesn't exceed a thousand square feet. The third item is it's on the same lot. And then the fourth item is uh, the unit meets all the access and water supply requirements of chapter five and the appendices from the fire code. Uh, and with that said, that is all of the current amendments for me. So I had a question. Okay. It says the youth of use of method PCP. What, what is that construction method? It's a particle board. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now what about like oriented strand board? Is that considered particle board or is that? No. So yeah, is that OSB acceptable? Is, OSB is a, a typical uh, sheathing that is used for the construction of shear walls or so that's typically so plywood and OSB are acceptable right mm -hmm. regular plywood and OSB are acceptable what right. we're omitting from Cupertino was the use of gyp board particle board uh, hard board structural fiber boards things that really don't have any structural value uh, nobody uses it anyway but we just wanted right. to make sure that we could no, I just that. wondered if OSB has enough structural value oh, yes, compared to plywood it's been tested okay yeah. Um, okay, that's the only question I had. I don't know anyone else. Is this a car? Oh, okay. Since, since it seems pretty significant, so your item one, all new one and two family dwellings will require sprinklers, integrated sprinklers in the structure from now on? Is that, am I interpreting that correct? Uh, actually, that's been in the code for probably yes. ten, 10 years now. So all new, based on the residential code, all new uh, single family, two family dwellings do require fire sprinklers, um, and that hasn't changed. So then why would it be added as a change item for the year? Well, what changed in this section, we, we couldn't take it out, it was already there, but what changed was um, the, the the accessory dwelling unit requirements from the state so we added that in number five but we just reiterated the same requirements we carried it over from the last code but we added number five great okay now i understand okay i do have two speaker cards here if you want to take these before any more council comments lisa warren and jennifer griffin welcome lisa So 
I fell out a card not really knowing where this was going to go, but I'm glad I did because I've already spoken about this and I am, whether you care or not, adamant about this. The exceptions for accessory dwelling units is unacceptable for fire. If it's not safe for someone to live in a 12,000 square, a 1,200 square foot building without fire sprinklers, why is it safe for someone to live in a thousand square foot or 999 square foot? It is totally bogus to say if the house, the existing house on the property that may be 20 or 30 years old and was not required to have fire sprinklers gives an exception to a new building. It's, it's ridiculous. It's, it goes every which way but wrong as far as life and safety. Because if people are packing more people into small units, you're gonna have, I, I won't go into all of it, but I can tell you I had a permit issued for my own home a little over three years ago. And the requirement wasn't, it wasn't even really a state requirement I learned later, but the city required fire sprinklers. So we had to, at our expense, we had to add fire sprinklers at the same time as our remodel. Along with, and I'll bring this up, Underground utilities, given pg es issues, I don't know where underground utilities comes into these new, um, new things from the state and this cycle, but we were also required to put underground utilities in, another big expense. And right or wrong, it is what it is, but I don't see why an ADU should get any exceptions. It's a dwelling unit. I don't care what size it is. It has the same purpose. It houses people and it needs to have the same safety requirements. Whether that's underground utilities, who knows, but certainly fire sprinklers. It was important enough for a single family home or a duplex, it's important enough for a single whatever ADU. And if anyone can explain to me why that isn't the case, other than you want to make it easier for people to build ADUs, which is a lame excuse for safety, then I want to know why I had to put fire sprinklers in my house. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Lisa. Uh, next is Jennifer Griffin. Um, good evening, City Council. I'm kind of going on the vein that Lisa did too. Um, our governor signed a whole packet of bills. While we were going through the pg e crisis, the governor was off signing the lame housing bills. Um, I, I can't condone that behavior. While the rest of the state was going through the pg e crisis, our governor was off signing <laughs> those non-democratic housing bills, and he did not make a statement back in Sacramento about what the rest of us were going through. To me, that is very, very serious. And none of the legislators in Sacramento did it either. Then again, we have a whole new slew of ADU building. Um, and I'm gonna echo what Lisa says. They are housing units and it is, it is lame to if you're going to be providing safe housing for people, you can't just build shacks in the back, shanties in backyards. San Francisco has some of the most bizarre garage conversions that go back many, many, many years. My mother-in-law lived in the uh, marina in a old apartment building and they had some legal, non-legal, some like really bizarre sets up. I don't even want Cupertino to go there. Um, I, I don't, and I will say right now that, okay, we have to build new construction, all right. We have a whole bunch, let's take HB 2001 in Oregon, which is state law right now. They say that you can pack four four housing units on an R1 lot, 5,000 to 6,000 square feet. Um, where there are no public utilities available to handle this new construction, this is in HB 2001. The cities have to provide these utilities, even if they can't afford them, 
And if they can't, the land can be seized to provide public utilities for these new crammed in housing units. And I'll just throw ADUs in there too. Is this what Cupertino and the state, our state is gonna wind up with with these bills? I will echo again. We went through a power crisis the last week. It was not gas, it was electrical. Um, electricity was shut off. So does this mean that in the future we're not putting in gas lines to new construction, including shanty ADUs in backyards? We have to talk about this because this is where it appears the Casa Compact is sending us. But I don't see, I'm not ready to abandon gas yet. And I think okay, we thanks, need to Jennifer. talk about this construction. But yes, we should, we should not have shoddy shanty ADUs. Thank you. Thank you. So if I'm reading this correctly, you would need sprinklers in an ADU if the existing house had sprinklers because you have to meet all of those conditions. Is that true? Correct. So I guess I, I don't understand why it's relevant whether or not the primary residence has them as to whether or not the ADU should be required to have them. It's actually, it was a state mandated requirement uh, allowance okay. for ADUs. So the state is saying the state that is you saying cannot if the primary sprinklers. The state is ADUs. saying if the primary residence does not have fire sprinklers, then the ADU if it meets all these conditions, one of them is the primary residence does not right. have fire sprinklers, but if it meets all these requirements, then fire sprinklers will be waived in ADUs. So we're required to waive them. We don't have a choice to require them. I thought these are local amendments, the ones we are adding in addition to the state right. amendment. So I'm confused. Yes, actually, I'm gonna allow Julie Linney to speak also about this issue. Julie Linney is the fire marshal for Santa Clara County. Okay, yeah, and I would like that question that the vice mayor had answered. If these are local, I mean, if it's a state requirement, why are these local exceptions? It is, it is a state requirement. Um, what we added to that local amendment is that we get a lot of confusion about the ADUs and what's required for sprinklers. So if the main house is not sprinklered by state law, you're not required to sprinkler the ADU. However, that doesn't um, exonerate you from doing water and access. And that's where we get people who come in um, saying, I don't have to sprinkler the ADU, but we're saying that we're also looking at water and access. If we can't get our fire engines close enough or we don't have enough water supply, then you would still have to require, the a require sprinklers for the ADU. Wait, you say the state, no, the state law is if the main house doesn't have sprinkler, we are not required to require sprinkler for the ADU, but then we can require, right? If they don't have the appropriate water and access, because you still have to look at Chapter 5 of the fire code requiring water and access. No, 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 no. right. The question yeah. is the state law. So what the amendment we are seeing here says, if the main house doesn't have sprinkler, we would waive a sprinkler requirement for ADU, but sounds like from you, that's not a state requirement. State law says, if the main house doesn't have ADU, it's up to the city to decide if we want to waive no. the sprinkler requirement or not. Well, well, in chapter five of the fire code, it requires that you have water and access, but we just put that into that amendment so it would be more clear for people. It doesn't mean that they, they aren't required to have the sprinklers. They still may have to, but they may not. If they have access to the ADU for the fire department, and if they have the appropriate water supply, then they don't have to sprinkler the ADU. Right, so I think what mm -hmm. the vice mayor is asking and I'm asking, are we exactly. permitted to require sprinklers for ADUs no matter what, or does the state prevent us from having that requirement. No, the state prevents you from doing that, but there are other avenues that you can look that, at that may require them to have it. Confused. <laughs> okay, right, because I mean, I feel that if we could, we should require it for ADUs, but what I'm hearing is we are not permitted to require so, correct. So the state ADUs. code is uh, if there is water access, they, we don't. We are not allowed to require a sprinkler. That's what, what a state code. What they're trying to do is that if you have a house that doesn't have a sprinkler system, and you want to put a, an accessory structure in the back of your house, um, and the main house isn't sprinklered, then you're not required to sprinkler it. However, 
there are other avenues that we have to look at that may indeed require them to sprinkler it, but under the residential code, it wouldn't have to, but under the fire code, it may. We're uh, being more restrictive than state. Yes. No. It seems from what you are saying is there are conditions under which we should require sprinkler. And, but then the code that we are reading now would say that no sprinkler will be required for ADO whatsoever. If they meet all the requirements, then we cannot, we cannot require them to have sprinklers. Okay. Maybe, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I may be incorrect, but maybe it'll help to uh, answer the question. So if a traditional house that had a garage in the backyard, it's got the driveway going to the garage in the backyard that then becomes an ADU. Now there's a fire back there and you're saying water access kind of indicates to me that you're going to take your truck and be able to get close to the ADU. On the other hand, if it was a house consuming the full width of the lot and they put an ADU in the backyard and it caught fire, you're faced with having to drag your hose through a gate and that may not be sufficient water to put out a fire on a thousand square foot ADU. So is that the water access or yes. are you talking about a faucet on the That's side of the I'm house? That's what I'm talking about is that water and access. So if you have a traditional house and you put an ADU in the back and I can drive my fire truck in front of the house and, and pull hose to 150 feet back to that, then they have the appropriate access. Nothing would be required. So we would, we would not have a sprinkler system in that ADU if, I, if they can meet that criteria. And that meant just going through the gate then? It doesn't yeah. need a wider, 10 foot wide? Uh... No, no. Okay. But now if you had an ADU that was on a very large parcel that was way back in, in the lot where we would have to be farther than 150 feet or 200 feet, then we would maybe require sprinklers because it's too far for us to get to to put that fire out. Now I understand. I'm sorry. Right, and in San Francisco, there's a bunch of houses that there's no gate, they're right next to each other. So if you put an ADU back there somehow, you would have no, no access. You need to have access to it, yeah. yes. So yeah, in what you described makes sense. If you have a really big lot and you have an ADU way in the back, even if the, the main house doesn't have a sprinkler, we should require sprinkler for that ADO way in the back because the fire truck couldn't reach them. If we can't meet the access, then that we could require them to have, yes. But then according to this amendment, we can't even require that. No, we can. So The amendment says that we can. The amendment says, it says if the house, main house doesn't have sprinkler, we can't require. They will be it waived. To, the it has to meet waived. all those requirements, all, f oh, five all of those four requirements. of the requirements. Yes. And the last one is Chapter oh. Five of the Uniform of the California okay. Fire Code that requires the water and access oh. for that property. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Rod, do you have any questions? No, I. Um, I guess my um, my only question is uh, has to do with the green. Uh, let's see the Cal Green amendments and Reach codes. Can we reiterate? Talk a little bit about why those aren't included in this update and what time schedule they are on. Yes, we actually have Andre um, Dravort to talk about that. Could you also talk about what they are? I think most people don't know. Yes. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council. Thanks, Albert. Um, so uh, as, as has been mentioned, we have a, a separate track process going on right now <clears throat> with uh, what we call reach codes in the uh, green building code part 11 of title 24 and part six the energy code uh, so what those are are the state mandated uh, energy efficiency and green building requirements uh, requiring uh, certain margin margins of uh, efficiency for uh, when you go to construct a new building uh, residential commercial or multifamily uh, what the uh, sustainability commission was tasked with this year was to study uh, what we call REACH codes. Uh, so as Albert's been describing, Title 24 has to be adopted in its entirety uh, by each uh, jurisdiction in the state of California. Uh, what REACH codes are, are uh, uh, extensions or uh, more strict requirements in green building or energy codes 
that are available for localities to study and adopt. Uh, what the purpose of reach codes are is really to allow local governments and communities to take a look at those uh, additional requirements in energy and green building and uh, consider those for adoption to meet their own uh, climate action plans or other environmental uh, goals that the city may have. Uh, so the, the Sustainability Commission's been tasked with that study. Uh, staff is assisting them with, uh, as Albert mentioned, a public outreach event uh, happening tomorrow as well as a special uh, Sustainability Commission meeting on the 24th of this month to consider the policy recommendations from staff. Uh, what we're considering is largely in line with the regional Silicon Valley Clean Energy uh, model code ordinance that's available uh, for public viewing at uh, Silicon Valley uh, reachcodes.com is the uh, location you can find those uh, model codes. The, uh, we also gave a presentation to the Planning Commission uh, last month uh, kind of outlining the, uh, the reason why the Sustainability Commission was asked to consider reach codes uh, given our current greenhouse gas uh, emissions um, and also the fact that we have uh, essentially a zero carbon electricity supply. So the, the uh, model codes are taking a look at either incentivizing or uh, largely uh, requiring electric uh, construction. Uh, given the fact that that would lock in a lot of carbon savings and uh, what they're finding as well is uh, perhaps lower cost of construction for all electric homes and businesses. So that's uh, just an outline of the reach code process. We thought it appropriate and the Sustainability Commission thought it appropriate to have a series of public outreach meetings on this topic. Uh, and because the uh, adoption of the whole Title 24 uh, building codes um, is happening on uh, the timeline that Albert described, uh, we thought it appropriate to have a uh, specific outreach for this topic. So there's been a lot of public uh, interest uh, in the area of climate action uh, planning and uh, especially given the, the fact that the city of Cupertino has adopted a, a climate emergency ordinance, uh, the, the urgency is, uh, has been pretty apparent from the public policy perspective and the public perspective. Uh, so that that's kind of the uh, time I got it. So, so we're basically on a, a schedule about a month later. Uh, well, well, actually, if uh, if things go whole, as planned, we should. Uh, so we're going to adopt one set of, of building codes, and then we're going to do, if we choose to go forward with the Cal Green and the Reach codes, we would do it again all again in a, about a month delayed. Is that right? Uh, if, if all goes as planned, we're uh, hoping to bring the, the uh, policy recommendations, the draft ordinance for City Council uh, first reading on the 19th of November. Mm -hmm. That would put us on track for perhaps a second reading on the 5th of December. Uh, and uh, we, for local amendments and reach codes, uh, we do need a certification from the California Energy Commission to show that this is a more stringent ordinance compared to the base energy code. Uh, and uh, the CEC has given us a 15-day review period if we submit that on January 1. Yeah, so we hit all those timelines. I mean, my question basically goes to we're doing this twice, and I guess if we had started our whole process with the things you're talking about a month earlier, maybe we'd be on track to do everything tonight, it sounds like. Uh, we've, we thought this sufficiently uh, different from the base building code that it deserved uh, that, that time for public outreach. Okay. But anyway, we're on track for a November hearing. Yes, we're on track for November 19th to bring this to council, uh, as well as uh, if adopted on, on time, we'll be on track for a January enforcement yeah. of any reach My code. belief is Mountain View is working on this item tonight for reach codes as well as... Correct, yeah, many, uh, all, all 13 uh, cities in Santa Clara, Santa Clara County have uh, either already adopted a reach code or are on track to bring something to their yeah, councils. So it's okay for us to be a follower sometimes. I'd, I'd say we're on a good <laughs> timeline here. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Anybody else have anything before we call for a vote? I have. All right, go. So the adoption will be January 1st. I'm not regarding reach code, this, this one on the agenda. The adoption will be January 1st. So for the projects that are now in the process, which one they need to follow? Actually, the adoption is the second hearing on um, November 5th. The effective date of the ordinance will be 30 days after that, which would be
the before January one. Oh, so so that's before the state review. It well, it's uh, already and, and effective. So the ci the the city ordinance becomes effective thirty days after November one. But we also have to get approval from the California Building Standards Commission, and I don't know what that timeline's on. I'm giving them seven weeks to review and approve our ordinance. So oh. we're hoping to get an effective ordinance by January 1, 2020. And, and the ordinance specifies that it applies to permits after January 1, 2020. So it doesn't, um, any um, permits before then would use the existing right. state codes and local exemptions and any permits after that would rely on the new state codes and local exemptions. Oh, okay. Okay, so anyone doing ADU, if they wait until after January 1st, they might, um, the waiver might apply to them? Any application submitted after January 1 will have to comply with the ordinances adopted. But if they submit it now, they would have to comply with the older one? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so... Do we have any, any idea how much um, extra cost it is for adding sprinkler for a single family home, like the one Lisa has? <laughs> Lisa can tell you, but I, I would say it's really not the cost of the labor of plastic pipes and the, um, and the sprinkler heads. You know, that's nominal cost. It's really the upsizing of the water main that would be required that would probably be the most Costly, is that? Oh. So, because from what I understand from the fire marshal, the main house is right on the main road. There is might be fire sprinkler right next to it. I mean, there are fire hydrant right next to it. So requiring sprinkler on a main house that's pretty close to, to the main road, why is that necessary? Would you like to? <laughs> My first comment on that has actually been a requirement for several code cycles now, but maybe yeah. Julie can. It, it's not a new requirement. So like he said, you know, for the past 10 years, any new construction has had a sprinkler system in there. So if you build something in the back, the state's saying if you already have a system in there, we want you to put it in the back as well. The other times that we have for, through the city ordinances, if you um, increase the house by more than 1,000 square feet, or the house becomes more than 3,600 square feet, then sprinklers are required, and that's a, that's a city amendment. So the state requires it, but then even in locations, that's really not necessary. They just shouldn't. I guess we could ask for the state to amend their state law so that sprinklers should not be required for houses that's actually pretty close to the, the main road, right? Well, it, it depends. I mean, we have houses now, if it stays under, if, let's just say you have a 2,000 square foot home and you choose to add 900 square feet, we would not really look at that to, for a, a sprinkler requirement. Only if you add more than 1,000 and the house becomes more than 3,600 square feet. And I would add again that we mm. should talk about how this relates to the um, exemptions for the state codes that we're mm -hmm. considering now. Okay, yeah. Um, so, thank you for that. So I think what we are seeing now is the local amendments. I'm still curious what in state code, what, what this version of the state building code is different from three years ago, what's changed. So whoever that's submitting a permit on January 1st would know what's coming. Maybe they want to submit before that, I don't know. Or maybe they want to do it after. So what exactly state code that's changed? Actually, I think if um, this, the, the, we weren't presenting the changes to the state, the significant changes to the state code tonight, we were actually just presenting the local amendment changes. Um, there are certainly significant changes in each and every code, including electrical, plumbing, mechanical, building, um, accessibility. I, it, it probably would take several I would, I would add it's all in our packet. 49 mm, pages yeah. of red yeah. lines. So I think no, we could so have a special. Who are experts and want to go uh, through this in detail are welcome to do I that. I know it's a lot. So is there something that p 
uh, that's important. You think someone trying to apply a permit should uh, keep in mind? Yes, there's actually a lot of classes on all our construction codes, every code that we just talked about, um, mm, specifically on si significant changes mm -hmm. of the state codes. Absolutely. Right. If we want to do a study mm -hmm. session that goes, talks about I don't want the to go updates. into detail. We have experts here. That's well, why I want to see if there are highlights that the public can right. learn about. Right. And that's why we should have a special study session and not because mm. those details will take a lot of time. Not detail highlights. Well, there the highlights will take a lot of time. Like I mean, I, I think we should have a study important. session separate from this meeting. Uh, and those that are interested could Because could we come are adopting that. the state code also. It's mandatory, but it's still right. a change to our city code. So I think we should uh, give the public some highlights on what exactly the state has required us to change. Right? So do you have some simple highlights you can uh, I do share? have some handouts okay. that uh, have been created, you know, with jurisdictions in the area that kind of highlight and go through each code that kind of specify some of the changes um, just to make it clear, you know, yeah, that could we help. We can actually hand that out at our public counter. We can identify which... Um, yeah, put it, on our, we'll put it on, the website. We that on our website. Yeah. We can create handouts for each individual code that we are okay, adopting. Uh, maybe Absolutely. attach it to the meeting record. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we can do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anybody else or uh, I just a, a quick question. So the the issue with the sprinklers and the four conditions, I mean, is that a preemption issue with the state? Yes, um, the code section is government code section 65852.2 subsection C that says that a local agency um, can establish regulations for ADUs and then the, the operative provision says access, accessory dwelling units um, shall not be required to provide fire sprinklers if they are not required for the primary residents. Um, and so that's the code preemption, the state law preemption of the okay. local. Uh, yeah, I just want to make sure that we're talking about the right legal concept here. It, it's not a matter of being able to become more restrictive because the state has spoken on this particular item and right. they're essentially preempting our ability to be more restrictive that's in this correct. case. Yes. In which case I would say, you know, I, I appreciate the efforts made to make sure that there's water accessibility and firefighting accessibility to those um, areas. And as to the details and the highlights, you know, absolutely. I think um, for the sake of clarity and public safety, um, members of the public would probably be interested, especially the ones that are interested in possibly building an ADU, um, in knowing what the parameters are going to be for uh, that accessibility and, you know, the, the water availability. Um, you know, that being said, I'll go ahead if there are, you know, more desires for discussion, uh, I'm, I'm fine with that after bringing the request, but I would like to ask that the city clerk uh, conduct the first reading of ordinance number 19-2189. Uh, this is the first reading of ordinance number 19-2189, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Cupertino amending City Code Chapters 16.02, 16.04, 16.06, 16.16, 16.17, 16.18, 16.19, 16.20, 16.21, 16.22, 16.23, 16.24, 16.25, 16.26, 16.27, 16.28, 16.29, 16.30, 16.31, 16.32, 16.33, 16.34, 16.35, 16.36, 16.37, 16.38, 16.39, 16.40, 16.41, 16.42, 16.43, 16.44, 16.45, 16.46, 16.47, 16.48, 16.49, 16.50, 16.51, 16.52, 16.53, 16.54, 16.55, 16.56, 16.57, 16.58, 16.59, 16.60, 16.61, 16.62, 16.63, 16.64, 16.65, 16.66, 16.67, 16.68, 16.69, 16.70, 16.71, 16.72, 16.73, 16.74, 16.75, 16.76, 16.77, 16.78, 16.79, 16.80, 16.81, 16.82, 16.83, 16.84, 16.85, 16.86, 16.87, 16.88, 16.89, 16.90, 16.91, 16.92, 16.93, 16.94, 16.95, 16.96, 16.97, 16.98, 16.99, 16.10, 16.11, 16.12, 16.13, 16.14, 16.15, 16.16, 16.17, 16.18, 16.19, 16.20, 16.21, 16.22, 16.23, 16.24, 16.25, 16.26, 16.27, 16.28, 16.29, 16.30, 16.31, 16.32, 16.33, 16.34, 16.35, 16.36, 16.37, 16.38, 16.39, 16.40, 16.41, 16.42, 16.43, 16.44, 16.45, 16.46, 16.47, 16.48, 16.49, 16.50, 16.51, 16.52, 16.53, 16.54, 16.55, 16.56, 16.57, 16.58, 16.59, 16.60, 16.61, 16.62, 16.63, 16.64, 16.65, 16.66, 16.67, 16.68, 16.69, 16.70, 16.71, 16.72, 16.73, 16.74, 16.75, 16.76, 16.77, 16.78, 16.79, 16.80, 16.81, 16.82, 16.83, 16.84, 16.85, 16.86, 16.87, 16.88, 16.89, 16.90, 16.91, 16.92, 16.93, 16.94, 16.95, 16.96, 16.97, 16.98, 16.99, 16.10, 16.11, 16.12, 16.13, 16.14, 16.15, 16.16, 16.17, 16.18, 16.19, 16.20, 16.21, 16.22, 16.23, 16.24, 16.25, 16.26, 16.27, 16.28, 16.29, 16.30, 16.31, 16.32, 16.33, 16.34, 16.35, 16.36, 16.37, 16.38, 16.39, 16.40, 16.41, 16.42, 16.43, 16.44, 16.45, 16.46, 16.47, 16.48, 16.49, 16.50, 16.51, 16.52, 16.53, 16.54, 16.55, 16.56, 16.57, 16.58, 16.59, 16.60, 16.61, 16.62, 16.63, 16.64, 16.65, 16.66, 16.67, 16.68, 16.69, 16.70, 16.71, 16.72, 16.73, 16.74, 16.75, 16.76, 16.77, 16.78, 16.79, 16.80, 16.81, 16.82, 16.83, 16.84, 16.85, 16.86, 16.87, 16.88, 16.89, 16.90, 16.91, 16.92, 16.93, 16.94, 16.95, 16.96, 16.97, 16.98, 16.99, 16.10, 16.11, 16.12, 16.13, 16.14, 16.15, 16.16, 16.17, 16.18, 16.19, 16.20, 16.21, 16.22, 16.23, 16.24, 16.25, 16.26, 16.27, 16.28, 16.29, 16.30, 16.31, 16.32, 16.33, 16.34, 16.35, 16.36, 16.37, 16.38, 16.39, 16.40, 16.41, 16.42, 16.43, 16.44, 16.45, 16.46, 16.47, 16.48, 16.49, 16.50, 16.51, 16.52, 16.53, 16.54, 16.55, 16.56, 16.57, 16.58, 16.59, 16.60, 16.61, 16.62, 16.63, 16.64, 16.65, 16.66, 16.67, 16.68, 16.69, 16.70, 16.71, 16.72, 16.73, 16.74, 16.75, 16.76, 16.77, 16.78, 16.79, 16.80, 16.81, 16.82, 16.83, 16.84, 16.85, 16.86, 16.87, 16.88, 16.89, 16.90, 16.91, 16.92, 16.93, 16.94, 16.95, 16.96, 16.97, 16.98, 16.99, 16.10, 16.11, 16.12, 16.13, 16.14, 16.15, 16.16, 16.17, 16.18, 16.19, 16.20, 16.21, 16.22, 16.23, 16.24, 16.25, 16.26, 16.27, 16.28, 16.29, 16.30, 16.31, 16.32, 16.33, 16.34, 16.35, 16.36, 16.37, 16.38, 16.39, 16.40, 16.41, 16.42, 16.43, 16.44, 16.45, 16.46, 16.47, 16.48, 16.49, 16.50, 16.51, 16.52, 16.53, 16.54, 16.55, 16.56, 16.57, 16.58, 16.59, 16.60, 16.61, 16.62, 16.63, 16.64, 16.65, 16.66, 16.67, 16.68, 16.69, 16.70, 16.71, 16.72, 16.73, 16.74, 16.75, 16.76, 16.77, 16.78, 16.79, 16.80, 16.81, 16.82, 16.83, 16.84, 16.85, 16.86, 16.87, 16.88, 16.89, 16.90, 16.91, 16.92, 16.93, 16.94, 16.95, 16.96, 16.97, 16.98, 16.99, 16.10, 16.11, 16.12, 16.13, 16.14, 16.15, 16.16, 16.17, 16.18, 16.19, 16.20, 16.21, 16.22, 16.23, 16.24, 16.25, 16.26, 16.27, 16.28, 16.29, 16.30, 16.31, 16.32, 16.33, 16.34, 16.35, 16.36, 16.37, 16.38, 16.39, 16.40, 16.41, 16.42, 16.43, 16.44, 16.45, 16.46, 16.47, 16.48, 16.49, 16.50, 16.51, 16.52, 16.53, 16.54, 16.55, 16.56, 16.57, 16.58, 16.59, 16.60, 16.61, 16.62, 16.63, 16.64, 16.65, 16.66, 16.67, 16.68, 16.69, 16.70, 16.71, 16.72, 16.73, 16.74, 16.75, 16.76, 16.77, 16.78, 16.79, 16.80, 16.81, 16.82, 16.83, 16.84, 16.85, 16.86, 16.87, 16.88, 16.89, 16.90, 16.91, 16.92, 16.93, 16
Um, is it three? Does anyone need a five minute break now? Okay, five minutes. update on revised community garden improvements project at McClellan Ranch Preserve. Um, can we have a staff report? 
Good evening, Mayor Sharf, Vice Mayor, Council Members, and members of the public. My name is Michael Zimmerman. I'm the CIP Manager for the City of Cupertino. Tonight I'll give you an update on the McClellan Ranch Preserve Community Garden Improvement Project. I will discuss the direction we received from Council, present the latest conceptual plan, discuss the design, review the project schedule, and the latest cost estimate, and describe how the project was sequenced to utilize volunteer forces. I will then turn the presentation over to Director Milk, who will discuss the use of volunteers in more detail and briefly describe um, potential ideas for satellite community gardens. This project has a history of dating back two years. Um, here's a brief recap. Uh, the project was first funded in fiscal year 16-17 in the amount of $30,000 for preliminary design. In fiscal year 17-18, $70,000 was added for the design of the project. In fiscal year 18-19, an additional $1.5 million was allocated for the construction of the project. Design began in earnest back in September of 2017 and was completed, advertised in August of 2018. As you can see in the middle of the slide, we received three bids uh, with a fairly significant um, range discrepancy, all of which were over the um, estimated um, engineer's estimate and the total budget. Staff re recommended and City Council authorized rejection of all bids on October 2nd, 2018, and two weeks later, the project was defunded. Um, next slide shows the layout that was um, advertised. Um, as you can see, it was a total of 115 plots, three different sizes, um, 11 large, 23 medium, 81 small plots. Um, it included nine ADA plots and seven master gardener plots. It was a mixture of in-ground and above-ground raised beds. And the amenities included three picnic areas, an outdoor classroom, a wash station, wheelbarrow storage location, compost bins, and shared storage. Um, the plots were arranged in a pod configuration, six to 10 plots per pod, and they were se separately fenced in. Uh, the community outreach for this plan is as follows. We went to the Parks and Rec Commission twice, back in November of 2017, again in April. We met with the gardeners on numerous occasions and we held two community meetings to solicit public input. The next slide will discuss what steps staff has taken since moving forward. So on June 18th, the City Council provided the following direction. They approved the budget. Um, They asked us to pursue volunteer opportunities to help reduce the cost, and they approved um, some funding for community gardens in um, and throughout the city. So the raised planter bed concept was identified to standardize the design and facilitate ease of construction. This was done primarily to assist with the control of ground pests. S staff purchased three raised bed kits and staff from Public Works and Parks and Rec assembled the kits. The three kits, one cedar, one recycled plastic, and one metal were then evaluated for overall quality, size, ease of assembly, cost, appearance, and expected life expectancy. None of the, none of the kits met the overall quality standard that we were expecting for the cost. Collectively, staff opted for the Redwood Planner design of a uniform size. Staff also looked at tasks required to construct the garden with the goal of using volunteers to reduce the cost. Four tasks were identified that appeared to be well suited for volunteer efforts. One was to construct the raised beds from kits. The second was to fill the planter beds with topsoil. The third was to spread wood chips in the walking aisle. And the fourth was to construct some picnic tables. This slide discusses the public input process Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council, Jeff Melkis, Director, Parks and Recreation. I'll take you through a little bit of some of the public in proce input process that we've gone through with the, um, the current update to the design. On September 17th, we met with a group of gardeners, uh, had a very spirited, very good conversation, um, and came away with many, many ideas and notes. On October 3rd, 
um, we sent a notice to ask gardeners if they'd like to attend the next Parks and Recreation Commission meeting, and a number of them did so. On October 4th, uh, we sent the uh, latest copy of the design to the gardeners for written review and received um, six different uh, thoughts and concepts. There was quite a bit of um, uh, agreement found within those, uh, within those uh, input letters. From the September 17th input from the gardeners, there's a list of different items in front of you that, it, that were very important to the gardeners, such as hose bibs to each plot. They really, it was important to the gardeners to have water that they don't have to walk across to where another person's plot is. They can, can install drip irrigation, say. Um, they were very, very in tune. Uh, many of the gardeners were actually master gardeners, and they um, were in tune to the idea of the pest uh, mesh netting below the garden, even to the technical part of how, how far down it needs to go. It needs to be connected in a flush manner at the, at the gates, uh, all with the intention of keeping the ground squirrels and such from uh, making the gardens unproductive. They requested things like uh, compost, bins, readily, or compost area readily, readily available. Um, they talked about the size of the raised beds. Um, they wanted to make sure that the gardens were very secure, that uh, folks walking in and around the preserve had the opportunity to enjoy the gardens and see them, but not necessarily enter the gardens, which is the best practice around the country and around the region for community gardens. Um, they asked for specific things in the design, like um, fruit trees that were in the, in the design um, because they were concerned about the, the shade. They asked us to move the, slide the garden down away from trees on, the, um, on one end specifically to account for greater levels of sunshine. Uh, but th these are all um, listed there in front of you, and they were really wonderful suggestions that, that helped us. On the October 3rd Parks and Recreation Commission meeting, uh, we received additional guidance from the, uh, from the commissioners. They had seen this several times and, and have participated in the past in terms of getting us to the point where we are now. This is a plan of what was presented to the Parks and Rec Commission on October 3rd and included gardener input from the 17th of September. The plan has subsequently changed due to comments received and the concerns that the project would exceed the $1.2 million budget. So an updated plan will be shown on, on the next slide. This is our current concept plan. It allows for 104 raised beds, includes eight ADA planters, six in-ground beds, and five beds for the master gardeners. It also includes the use of ad alternates. Um, we have four ad alternates identified. One is for the shade structure that you see on the lower left corner, the fencing of the master gardener area, um, picnic tables, and a potential to expand the garden into the phase two area um, if additional funding is identified. The plan also reflects the comments we received from the gardeners. It, uh, we did relocate the master gardeners to the upper left corner. Um, so that their planter beds could be constructed with the remainder of the raised beds. Um, we also looked at, at some constructability issues for the garden. Right now we have wire mesh underneath the entire site. Um, that was originally planned to be two feet deep. We um, raised that up to one foot deep and that had a considerable cost savings since we didn't have to remove most of the dirt. Uh, on the left side, you'll see four beds that are rotated in a north-south configuration. That was based on gard uh, gardener input. They were looking for some shade and they wanted to be um, oriented in that fashion. We also determined that city staff should cut, assemble, and install the raised beds. Previously, we had thought that um, this was something the volunteers could do. Um, based on input we received from, from our demonstration project um, and feedback from our maintenance staff, we felt that's better accomplished with uh, city forces. We also shifted the garden 20 feet to the east to um, better take advantage of the sunlight and get away from the trees. And again, I, we, we employed um, al at alternates. So in the event that um, we get good bids, we can add some scope back into the project. 
This is a picture of what the raised beds look like. Whoop. So this is kind of the, the thought, current thought right now. It's um, two by material, um, four by four posts to the corner, uh, hose bib to every, every plot, wood chip aisle ways, um, kind of a uniform size, uniform appearance. So, so these are not kits anymore, right? You're going to just Th buy these the are not lumber. kits anymore. We're going to buy the lumber. Thank you. Cut the lumber, pre-drill okay. the lumber. Great. Yep. Okay. Um, I'd like to address the volunteer effort. Um, in order to come within the budget, the 1.2 uh, million, I can tell you that it would have been very difficult, if not impossible without employing the sweat, equ sweat equity, in a sense, of the gardeners. So this is what we'll be asking them to do. The, um, the ch spreading the chips around the garden, that's a considerable effort. Things like putting the uh, picnic tables together, um, helping to uh, fill in and augment the soil, ensure that the soil inside of each of these uh, boxes are spread and, and ready to go. Um, we'll be, staff will be using small, you will be using equipment to um, actually deliver the soil to the, to the beds, but then the volunteers will take over from there. They will also be assisting with some of the, um, uh, some of the construction of the beds. Um, we have been approached since we started talking about this by um, several groups of people, including a Boy Scout group and including a large group of master gardeners who are um, standing by and waiting and very enthusiastic about getting involved. So um, we're planning on, um, after the initial construction, whether permitting, that we, can, w we could hold and host some work parties in the March and April time frame. Um, at the end, when we have a, a functioning community garden and we've done our grand opening and we're, we're growing you know, wonderful produce, um, we also will continue to require the gardeners to invest not only in the common areas around their plot, but in the common projects that go with running a community garden. There will be a set number of hours that each gardener will be asked to, to put in. And um, in the past, I, you know, my experience has been that those have been very productive and very satisfying experiences for the gardeners. This slide reflects our current construction cost estimate. Um, as you can see, the $698,000 um, estimate of probable construction costs, that's significantly lower and reflects um, A, the use of volunteers, and B, the um, raising of the hardware cloth that's under the entire site that led to a considerable cost savings. Um, the city will purchase the material to build the raised beds. They will provide the soil and the wood chips, and they will assemble the, the raised beds. Um, if the actual bids match the estimate, we would be in a position to potentially include one or more of the ad alternates. Again, that was the shade structure, fencing in the master gardener area, um, additional picnic tables, and possibly um, expanding into the phase two expansion area. And this slide shows our current schedule. Um, we're anticipating being wrapped up with the design at the early November, um, going out to bid in the month of November and awarding December 17th. Um, the goal here is to start by January 20th or actually any time before February 1st, which is the start of bird nesting season. Um, if for any reason we, we cannot start before February 1st, primarily due to weather, um, we might be delayed until September. Um, again, we have some money set aside for some biological monitoring, so we'll do some um, bird surveys during the, during the time before construction, and then if we get delayed and there's a, a delay of greater than two weeks, we need to do another survey to make sure we're not affecting a, a nesting pair. Um, again, the most cautious approach then would be to delay until September, which is the, the end of bird nesting season. I'd like to take a moment and address the satellite gardens. Uh, as you recall, um, you asked us to set aside from the 1.5 million, 300,000, to create opportunities uh, to deliver gardening opportunities uh, geographically distributed around the city. So we've, um, taking the guidance that we're given, um, are looking at somewhat of a grassroots approach, whereas we would look at um, applicable 
in appropriate spaces as they are uh, as they come to us and and look at our different parks as examples, specifically in the east part of the city as we're um, uh, uh, approaching building the garden in the west where you know we've got over a hundred plots. Um, we're looking at something along the lines of a neighborhood opportunity gardening grant, um, something that would uh, would be eligible for nonprofits to apply. Uh, it's not the intention that the money would be everything needed to get these uh, mini gardens, say, off the ground. They would be, in a sense, seed money for nonprofits that could be schools, could be churches, could be how how you'd like to approach you know approach it. We would take a grant program with specific criteria um, to the Parks and Recreation Commission and ask them to help define and design uh, a, a way, a path moving forward here. Um, what would make a good garden? We can provide a number of those criteria and certainly we would need at the end of the day to approve the sites to ensure that they are functional and that they're open to the public and a number of other things. They would have to meet environmental and ADA standards. Um, and, and so we would hold back a little bit of that money so that if we end up with garden opportunities in our parks that we could also uh, participate. We may need to move and, you know, and extend irrigation and the like, um, we'll see. There is another approach, and that would be a city-led led approach, and I'd like to, to just address it for a moment. Um, given that there's 300,000 and that, that um, we're looking at how we can decrease the number of gardeners that are demanding gardens or, or finding themselves on long-term wait lists, um, it would be really great to get as many gardens and getting many garden plots as possible. A city-led approach that doesn't take advantage of nonprofit opportunity to assist may not get you as much proverbially, you know, bang for the buck there with the 300,000. Um, would not get us as many, you know, we don't believe it would get us as many plots out there on the east side. Um, as you can see from what we wrote, um, it would still require significant volunteer investment, um, but that is an opportunity. And um, so, questions and next steps. Um, we would be looking at, um, as, as we, we said, um, advertising the overall project for bid around November, um, and then looking at the neighborhood community gardens a little bit further down the road, um, in, again, engaging the Parks and Recreation Commission, um, if that's the way that, that, that's the will of council, um, and then moving forward with your input and the public's input for those satellite opportunities. And that concludes our more formal presentation. Great, so if, before we bring it back to council, I have one card here from Jean Bedord. Welcome, Jean. Good evening, Mayor Scharf and council members. My name is Jean Bedord and I live in Cupertino. I want to thank the staff for a very well done proposal for the community gardens at McClellan Ranch. They're certainly popular with a segment of Cupertino. However, as a resident who is not a gardener and who would not benefit from the proposed $10,000 per plot, I question the outlay for this project. It involves 1.2 million and would benefit only 120 gardeners, plus your volunteers, far less than even 1% of city residents. Please step back and look at the bigger picture of how you're spending taxpayer money, my money. Two weeks ago, this council failed to fund a consultant to identify corrective actions for the operational losses for the golf course 
at Blackberry Farm. <clears throat> so council is choosing to waste this money on an ongoing basis. At the same time, council is spending an inordinate amount of money on legal expenses with zero benefits to its residents. It's already spent more than a million dollars in legal expenses with more to come with the Friends of Better Cupertino and the Valco downsizing lawsuit. In the meantime, the city infrastructure has been neglected. There was a major power outage this week. And fortunately, there was advance notice and only parts of the city were impacted. The emergency response center had time to be activated. But we may not be so lucky next time. Plus, last time, last night, there was a 4.5 earthquake. I think there was another one tonight. And they don't provide any warning. As I well know from living through the Loma Prieta earthquake in 1989, we know that City Council, that City Hall is not seismically sound. And the power structure is held together with the proverbial chewing gum and bailing wire. So how would the city function with an outage of days or weeks? So tonight, I ask you to re-examine your spending of taxpayer dollars. Are you res being responsible in spending 1.2 million on behalf of 120 gardeners? Aren't you ignoring your responsibilities to the rest of the residents of Cupertino? Thank you. Okay, so we'll bring it back to council. Um, <clears throat> so who wants to go? John, do you have any comments on this? I'm still digesting things, and so I, I will have a few comments, but I'll wait for a few minutes. Okay. Councilmember Paul. So with respect to the, the current layout, was that changed after the Parks and Recreation Commission meeting based upon some of the uh, input from the commissioners as well as the public? Yes. Okay, and in what way was that modified? We shifted the entire garden about 20 feet to the east. Okay. We uh, moved the master gardener location from pretty much next to the ADA area into the, the northeast, or sorry, northwest corner. Mm -hmm. um, we moved the shade structure to the, the bottom left on the screen, and um, we added two more sheds, so they're more centrally located to all the gardeners, and we eliminated the four um, fruit trees that were previously okay. shown. Great. Um, my other question is, is there a cost estimate with regard to how much was saved through the use of uh, prospective use of volunteers as well as the uh, uh, ceasing of the proposal to use kits to uh, create the planter boxes? We're saving approximately $100,000. Um, the uh, proposal that we had shown to the Parks and Rec Commission we had a uh, deficit of about $75,000 in funding. I see. And um, with the changes we've made, um, specifically with raising the, the hardware cloth, we were able to bring that in under budget. Um, OK, so that's just in the last couple of weeks? Yes. That happened? Okay. Yes. OK, great. Thank you very much. So oh, do you want to go first? Either I'll, way. I'll go. Okay. So with the hardware cloth underneath the whole thing, do you not have to put the hardware cloth Additionally, under each bed, or how does no, that work? No, we're still going to put the hardware cloth underneath each raised bed, sort of I double see. protection. Okay, so a year or so ago, my my daughter was is in America was in AmeriCorps, and I was constructing garden beds with volunteer labor at elementary school in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I I know I heard oh you volunteers can't do that. Um, but let me just say, we had very unskilled volunteers, and they were <laughs> able, so what I did, I pre-drilled all the lumber and cut it, but they were definitely able to assemble these um, without any problem, without anybody, I don't think there were any serious injuries. I'm not sure what the if this is a liability issue or why we think that the volunteers could not assemble the garden boxes and it would take city staff. So, so given the volume of material, um, 
if we had staff first cut the lumber, pre-drill the lumber, and then package each each bed into a package and then deliver it to the uh, to the preserve, yeah, um, and then supervise the construction of the beds. Um, it was thought to be more efficient if they would just assemble the whole thing. Um, they could pre-drill on site, right, um, okay. and just put it together while they were while they were there. So they would do all the transport. It would be done basically on site versus um, having to package it, deliver right. it to the site, stage it. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully it wouldn't get stolen or vandalized. And then um, you know, wait for volunteer day to have people come in. The logistics of trying to assemble 100 beds um, that are 16 feet long, six feet wide. Right. Um, All right. You know, fair just the number of red okay. chips you need is. is <laughs> um, so the other thing for the additional beds throughout the city. At the time we're buying all this lumber, hopefully we're buying it directly from the uh, wholesaler. I mean, would it make sense to buy more lumber at that time for the additional beds that we're going to put in in the future, or would that not be any savings that are worthwhile? Because we'd uh, have to store it then, it, too. It's a storage issue for us. The, the yard's pretty full right now, um, and depending on when exactly we, we install those, um, a is storage, B it's we don't want anything to happen with the material. Right. So um, I think we're better off to, as we identify where it goes and how many we need, um, purchase lumber right as, as we need it. And are there any ever any grants available for this kind of thing? I suppose, but I'm not I'm not familiar with any off the top of my head. Okay. Okay, that's all I had. Thank you, Ron. Sure. So I, I am struck by the, the cost per gardener. At $10,000 a box, I, I have two raised beds that I made myself. And I suppose with drip irrigation and everything, I spent 250 bucks per box. I put a fine mesh underneath. I stapled it in. I don't have something under my entire yard. But it's this is, with all these you know, three hundred thousand dollars in soft cost. It's a third of, of the hard cost, and and all it really adds up to a lot of money for how many? A hundred? Is that right? A hundred and four gardeners. Yes. I mean, wow. Yeah, it's staggering how much it costs. So, what, what was our policy before, on who got to to use these uh, these gardens? Um, it has Did been. Did people pay for those? Did they, it, it, could they just renew on an annual basis in perpetuity, or what? Exactly. They pay a fairly minimal fee, and then. Um, How much was that? I think it's about eighty dollars a plot per year, mm -hmm. and then they're able to continually renew. However, we have um, started to work with the gardeners on this. Um, our operating policies: we are considering a five-year limit in order to ensure that everybody gets a chance. Um, we look at this garden as more than just a garden. It's a, it's a park. It's an opportunity mm -hmm. to not only um, uh, present a sustainable way of, of eating and growing your own produce, but it's a nice thing to look at as you walk and, and see. And, and again, it's in a very expensive area to build because it's in the nature preserve. And so we have to be very careful. We've, have, we've taken a lot of steps to ensure that these gardens are productive. Hence the underground mesh, uh, 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 six foot well, fences around it with flashing. Tell me again why you need an underground mesh under the entire thing, why it's not adequate to simply put it under, incorporate in the bottom of each box? Because we need a closed system, and this has been rep uh, recommended also by our master gardeners group. Because if well, I, maybe the master gardeners want to donate some for this project. Uh, I mean, honestly. Yeah. Well, um, if it's not a closed system, if we only put the exterior fence around to keep the say the ground squirrels out, then they can still burrow underneath and come up on the inside of the of the garden, even though they don't have to climb over. You know, they'll, they'll still find a way in. This is a, some as foolproof as we and our consultants can come up I with. See. So, so the idea is they could, there could be critters that come up and then get access, not through the bottom of the box, but 
in, in the, the spaces oh. around the box. I see. Okay. Uh, that's helpful. Well, that's something I should think about, too, <laughs> I guess. Um, okay. And, yeah, to the point of constructing the boxes, mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, we've had Eagle Scout projects doing things actually exactly this thing in in many places we've had you know a lot of our, I know rotary has installed garden boxes going into the store and buying lumber could we not simply um, have volunteers do that mm -hmm. the people well, that are going to be using these things absolutely I think the intention here is um, for staff to kind of take the lead and then keep the door open for volunteers to assist. We'll, we won't have a shortage of volunteer support. Um, and, and certainly putting the boxes together and bolting them together is, is a real help, and, the, and that will be welcome from the volunteers. Um, what we need to do is to ensure uniformity and to yeah, ensure no, the quality I, I, of so the, the, the cement post and all. Right, so I, I get why we should be procuring the materials. I'm not sure we should be doing more than that, frankly. Uh, we have a lot of handy people in the community that know how to use a sure a saw in the field and help help me hear that some of the feedback you got from the gardeners was they don't want something about the public's as access to these things. Can you talk about Ab what the public's access is to be able to wander through? The well, area? they can wander around the gardens, but okay. again, the, the best practice is that there will be a security code or a lock so that people that are gardening can have access. Uh, we want to make sure that um, others don't go into the garden, leave the gate open, um, pilfer produce. It's not very likely, but it's possible. And, and this is the practice that's been adopted by other gardens in the area. So, you, so what you're saying is if I don't own one of these hundred plots, I can't walk into this garden? Um, not without um, a staff member accompanying you or a tour or an opportunity to do that. Well, I, I don't know why we should be spending any public money on this. I, I, under those conditions, we're, we're on public land. Uh, we're, I mean, in the prior project, we could. We could... Everybody could go. I could show my kids as they were growing up uh, how these fruits were grown. And yes, people typically had cages around, right? Mm -hmm. But if all we can do is observe from the outside, I'm not in favor of this project at all. Thanks. Okay. Okay, Vice Mayor. Um, thank you. You thank you for bringing down the project called summary. So you also mentioned that the design cost from the past two years. How much was that? I didn't catch it. The uh, previous design eff efforts? Yeah, you mentioned uh, 2017, 18. Uh, you didn't put down in your slide, no, I, but I, I you mentioned as you were t um, right. talking. Um, we were just under $100,000 for that effort. So the earlier design was right. $100,000. Yes. Um, okay. So the, could you put the project call summary slide here? Yeah. Thank you for bringing the cost down. So it seems like the, the actual construction cost is about $0.7 million. And then we have construction contingency another design for $110,000, environmental and city staff time. I thought usually when we budget for CIP, city staff time is not counted as part of the budget. Like the parks and rec, we had the, I mean, a bike trail project spent a ton of staff time, but it was never converted into dollars as a project cost. So with the zero-based so budgeting that we've employed, we're now char charging all labor to the projects if it can be directly attributed to that project. So um, since we're relying on city maintenance staff who basically have a full-time job mm -hmm. that does something else, this would be over and above that. So we want to capture that cost 
and transfer it to the project. Okay, so that. So I mean, we we could make the decision not to charge city staff time to this, but then um, that would. Okay, I'm just curious because as I I asked about how much city staff time we spent on the Rignard Creek Trail project, I was told that's not accounted for. And so we do account for those in our budgeting. So past practice has been that we weren't charging to the project or not all divisions within public works were charging to the project. We're trying to change that past practice so that we get an accurate accounting of what each project really costs and then we can budget appropriately. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. My understanding is your June activity or just before June when you did the zero base, so zero base review of the budget, then you had a full cost element in there so that you capture now full cost yeah, for projects. Yeah, so that's just started this year. Yeah. Oh, okay. So the CIP budget we would be looking at from now on would include the staff time. That's correct. Okay. And then why do we need 100,000 for construction management? So that would that be managed by staff time also or a consultant? This is a consultant construction manager. Uh, they would be responsible for ensuring that um, the plans and specs are adhered to for the um, elements that the contractor is responsible for. So the perimeter fence, the grading, making sure the hardware cloth is installed correctly, um, the, the pathways are constructed where they're supposed to go and to the sufficient thickness. Um, they would be responsible for, for, responsible for constructing the ADA planter beds. Um, basically all the hardscapes elements that um, aren't being uh, performed by volunteer or city forces. And this, this group would manage that effort, make sure the contractor adheres to the requirements. Um, they get paid, they, um, they get paid in a timely manner that they answer any questions um, and they make sure that the contractor finishes in a timely manner. That seems, uh, well, I don't know the cost, but it seems a lot <laughs> for, for just managing one community garden project. And so that's not part of the con contract. Uh, so, so again, this is an estimate at this point. Um, we haven't reached out to a uh, construction management firm to get a cost proposal, but um, based on previous experience, this is um, basically not to exceed. So number. we usually don't manage our own project. No. So like McLaren, uh, McLaren Road bike path project, we also have a con consultant to manage the I would say 99% of all CIP projects are um, have a consultant construction manager. Hmm. We, we still provide a city project manager, but they're stretched pretty thin. They're managing five to seven projects by themselves. So we don't have the level of resources to also manage the construction. So we hire a consultant to, to perform that service for us. Okay. A hundred thousand is uh, okay, um, but I mean, I yes, it's costly. However, we just spent two point one million dollars for a very short bike pass segment, and we just spent one point eight million dollars for a pilot shuttle program. For every project, not everyone is going to benefit, but each project will benefit some part of the com rest community. So I guess not, it won't be all equal, but some people will benefit from this project, some might benefit from another project, yeah. So I do still support the garden project, but then I, I think for every project, we should try to keep the cost low. And another thing is, thank you for including the comments from the gardeners. So the outreach was only done to gard gardeners who currently using use these plots. And w is there any outreach down to the entire community who might want to use it? Um, yes, although most of our input was from stakeholders, which are, were gardeners, people who weren't gardeners yet, but on a waiting list. Um, we did host two community meetings, and there were other indivi interested individuals that, that came. The community meetings were in relation to the original design in 2018. Um, mm. This time around, 
many of the same features flowed through, uh, but no, we didn't open up for the general public on this one. Okay, so among the, could you bring up the list of comments from the gardeners? I'm just curious, how many of those uh, concerns are addressed by the new design? Let me see. Here. Actually, all of these that you see were incorporated. Mm -hmm. there, were, there were a few others, there was a handful of others that we did not choose. For instance, there was a suggestion that we bring feral cats. There was a suggestion that we have less garden plots and make them bigger sized plots. And we just thought that was inconsistent with the values of the project. Um, for the most part, we did everything we could um, to incorporate everybody's suggestions. We had one group of folks that really told us they wanted to play with their rototillers. So there are six beds that are not raised beds as a result of the request. Now again, there'll be others that'll be able to use those that may very likely want a non-raised bed. Um, but, you know, again, we tried to meet everybody's need as, as we possibly mm, could have. Okay, so, so all of these inputs are incorporated into the current design? Yes. And then the next page uh, has more inputs, so those are also addressed? Yes, they're all, all, the, all of these are actually addressed. Okay, great. So then the next page is Parks and Rec com Commission comments. Have they, Parks and Rec Commission, did they make any recommendation on s something you would like, they would like to see that you cannot address? No, they did not make a formal, um, a formal recommendation, but in the presentation, they were concerned about many of the same things that we're concerned about, having to do with weather delays, say, um, ensuring that, um, well, one of the requests that was made by, by the commission is that we really, really look back at the original concept and, and to recommend not um, decreasing the size of the budget. Mm -hmm. It was a comment, we, we listened to it, and um, it's, it's out there in the record, but we know that we're, we're heading toward the 1.2. Mm, okay. So you have reduced the cost significantly. Mm -hmm. and, um, but then as a result, we split the project into phase one and phase two. Phase two is uh, about one third, no less than one third. Well, if, if you remember. A part that will be built later. That would be, would be very nice if it could be built later. The reality is we've increased um, the number of plots by um, about a quarter in this design from what we had before. So um, it would be preferable to go to phase two, um, but right now w we're pleased that we're able to deliver to you in the budget a greater number of plots as they are. Okay, um, you mentioned that the earlier design has seven master garden plots. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? What is a master garden plot then? How many we have now? These are primarily used for teaching. Um, well, the garden isn't operating, so we don't have any as we speak, but typically uh, a community garden would, would incorporate two or three or four plots, five plots. Um, they've requested that they have an internal fence. Um, this, is the, this is the place for teaching. Our staff would work with them uh, when so school kids So do we have those in the current design? Yes. Which part is a master garden? It's this part. What do we, wh which direction? Uh, so Can we do that? Oh. And then it, it's in the upper left. So this will be fenced in. The fencing, I believe, is a, is a bit alternate depending on the budget. Okay. So yeah. I agree with Rod that if, it sounds like the current design is well fenced the entire thing in. And if you are not one of the 104 gardener who have a key to the mm -hmm. place you can even go in and walk and admire all the plants. I really enjoyed uh, our previous garden that we can walk around. Yes, it's all fenced in individually, but then we can walk around and uh, observe the different vegetables that they are growing. 
and now we don't have that opportunity anymore. So well, I'm I w I'm concerned about that. Well, uh, staff would prefer I would prefer to see the gardens open to the public. However, the the design prior to the reduction in the budget included interior fencing, and as as a result of reducing that budget down to the 1.2 million, the interior fencing was a big part of that. It was very I mean, expensive. Once again, couldn't we have people that have leased these plots put up their own fencing if they so choose? Well, um, I would invite... Well, why wouldn't we do that? Well, um, the look of the garden, the feel of the garden, the, the productivity the of the garden... The feel of the garden that nobody can get in except mm -hmm. the people using it? it it, it, I mean, when the garden was open before, it became somewhat of a shanty town from its looks, and we discovered numerous issues that were safety related, where people couldn't walk up and down the pathways without running into things that were protruding. Um, to that extent, we thought, well, we would just incorporate consistent interior fencing, so there wouldn't be the opportunity to build, um, uh, you know, to build construction within the individual garden plots. Um, when we reduce the budget, again, now we, we can go back to that part of the design, the pod design, that is something that you know, some of the gardeners spoke about would like, but there is a di an additional cost to that. Mm. Well, could, couldn't, we have, couldn't we have a standard covering kit to keep birds out? I mean, this is what most people I know, including I have, my raised bed. I use some PVC pipe in this case and some bird netting effectively and I you know hold that bird netting down. Couldn't we have a standard issue thing? You can rent you can rent that too or you can you can buy here's the prescribed kit if you want to cover your your plot. Of I mean, course we, 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 this is a gold plated garden project. Mm -hmm. At ten thousand dollars a box, yes. this is a gold plated project. Well, again, much of the, the much of the cost for the gardens is because it's in the preserves, and we have to move a lot of soil, and plant the mesh, and connect it all underground, as the pest. So, so how much does, aside from the costs of the underground mesh and net and fencing, how much does each garden box cost in terms of lumber and and mesh and dirt and you know, is it three hundred dollars? Is it five hundred? Or I'd have to get back to you with the exact number. Um, I mean, I mean, you must have a, a breakdown of the costs of. I mean, the six hundred ninety-eight thousand twenty. It's approximately fifteen hundred dollars a box for the master gardener planter boxes. For the master and the other ones, are and, and they're similar to the, eight, the to the other raised beds, um, six by sixteen. Mine are only four by eight. Um, we looked at other gardens yeah. in the area too, when when working with this uh, potential design. The garden in Mountain View that just opened at Lawson is very similar in the design and the look, and. Um, I need to, I'd like to get back to that picture if I could. I think it, it, I went the wrong way, didn't I? Let's see if we can get it. This. It, right. it, it presents a very clean, crisp appearance. Um, again, interior fencing is definitely an option. Um, we can, uh, do a little research and come back. If we had that, we wouldn't necessarily need the security with the outside fence. But again, my experience has been sometimes people don't always leave the gate um, closed if they don't have a motivation to do so. Well, you have spring, spring loaded gates, mm -hmm. a pair of them or something. Well, I, yes, I've, I've, I've worked with many different designs of gates and gardens and they seem to be left open if there isn't a motivation to uh, ensure that you, you do close and lock it and take your so key out of the right lock. So right now, the current design do have a gate that people will have to close, and then it will be 104 mm -hmm. of them. All yes. of them, one of them might leave it open. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's the it, same it, thing, whether it, it's individual. <laughs> it, it, it is, but it isn't. 104 
versus many, many more people that could be coming in and out. The gardeners were just very, very concerned about uh, potential pilferage of their, their garden and, and the like um, as well. Oh, you mean we would like the gate to be closed to keep uh, animals out? Is that yes. the reason? Th that's the primary purpose, or one of the, the primary purpose of the gate is to keep the animals and the pests out. Um, the reason that we secure it is to ensure, um, now, again, at the will of council, we're happy to, to not have it secured. It, it just is a best practice, but Cupertino is mean, a unique city. It's a very the, safe city. And isn't there a way that the door can close by itself Absolutely. automatically so that it cannot be held open? Mm -hmm. So people going, they will shut right away. There must be that mm -hmm. kind of door, right? Yeah, well, I um, think the question is, is whether or not you, you'd like it to be a secure environment or have uh, the public to be able to roam through and enjoy the garden. I would like the public to roam through because uh, that's the purpose of having to fund a community garden. I don't garden that much, but then I would like to admire other people's work. My husband loves it because he he used to plant a lot of vegetables as a kid. So he always, we always walk around, he would point out, this is what a vegetable, I can recognize them, but mm -hmm. we love to walk around and look. Can we get back to the, the current design? So there is an option. Instead of fencing the whole thing, I'm wondering, is it possible to maybe like making some sections of close the ones then that way at least we can i can walk around certain part <laughs> so we can mm -hmm. so I, I can yeah. still walk around and then they can have like this section locked that section locked black section locked that's a good idea then yeah, th that, that's i can as still I said, enjoy them <laughs> that was our original uh, but then it's it, more costly Right, yes, of course. It's, it's, it's more costly, and that is actually the pod concept. You've drawn five pods, and that's exactly the concept that we originally had. And, and the, the inside, the red part, uh, the drawing is what we lost in, in the budget reduction. Um, so the fencing, how much is the fencing? The interior fencing that we reduced. Michael, is this chain link fence or what? Is it? It's, um, it's welded wire fabric so it's um, it doesn't have the appearance of, of chain link but it's um, redwood framed with a, uh, a wire mesh and, then and as an additional protection we were going with the half inch grid um, just to make sure that if a rodent got in they might not be able to get to all of the pods so um, but that was value engineered out when we we're trying to look for cost saving opportunities and if we have the the entire outside fencing right the inner one doesn't have to be too secure, right? It could be very cheap just so to keep polite people out, right? Exactly. And, but and it, they don't have to look very nice. I mean, gardens, they are messy by nature. It, just given the size of the gardens, the fencing starts to add up, even if it's just an incremental cost. By the time you multiply it by the number of linear feet that you're going to have to install, <coughs> it becomes a big number. Um, we can look at that. We can look at lower cost alternatives. Um, in some cases, it does affect the, the configuration because we have to uh, create wider aisleways, which then um, reduces the number of uh, plots that we can put in. You but probably need to use this part, expand. I'm sorry, I don't have visibility oh, to this. This part, oh. the, the phase two. That, that I mean, would adding, adding the aisle probably means you'll need to use the whole area. Potentially, yes. We yeah. would have to expand a little bit wider just to get certain aisle ways that can accommodate a fence and then have a four foot aisle on either side of it. And, and it also raises the, the cost <laughs> fairly significantly to go that direction because now we've got to add the rest of the pest protection and the, the exterior fencing. So can, can you go back to the picture of the beds? By the way. Back, 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 back. So I know when I built beds at my house, the, f the four by fours at the corners, I made much higher so I could put mesh all the way around. 
what, what keeps birds out of these when you don't have any anything covering it? Currently, there's no bird protection. So, uh, depending on the, the management rules, we'll allow people to put in a, a screen or a netting over their, their plots. But again, we're trying to control the, the look and the appearance. Right. That's why it worries me is that if you don't prep the design to have screening that's um, not all haphazard, that you're going to have all sorts of ugly. You're going to have PVC, and you're going to have you know scrap lumber. Um, I would just like some plan, yeah, and it would be at the plot owner's or the plot renter's expense to add it, but at least prep the design to make it easy to do something that doesn't look terrible. Well, and consistent, right? I mean, if you said if you want to enclose this for either security or birds or whatever, here's our prescribed way of doing that. You do that at your expense. Right, and I mean that- kit will sell you to do that. I mean, that, the only thing for I'm example. thinking of is those, the four, I don't know if there, is there any four by fours in the middle as well? Or is it just at the four corners? I can't tell by the picture. You know, he's gotta have a few of them, it's a 16 foot. Right, at 16 feet, you'd yep. think you'd have to have. I mean, I'm just, the ones I built, I think are seven feet by, 14 feet and yeah when I designed I said hey I need a way for the bird protection that's not gonna you know sorry Rod I didn't want to use PVC <laughs> well I did I mean there are hoops you can buy I mean right. there are standardized ways of protecting these beds that so could can give I, a uniform yeah, look sure. can ahead. I uh, intervene here so I'm hearing a redesign that's what I'm hearing well I don't know if it's a redesign I, I, I hear a desire for the public Access. Access. Now, I'm not, I mean, personally, I think the public could go in if they're accompanied by one of the many gardeners that are going to be out here, and they would just have to ask someone, you know, can, can I come in and look? Um, but I do understand why you want to yeah. keep it secure. Otherwise, um, anyone can come in anytime and <coughs> start helping themselves to whatever produce there is. I mean, if the birds don't get it first. So, um, so I might chime in now and make some comments. Okay. And so to me, um, the, the $1.2 million to me really sets a requirement for the community to be able to use it. We have community fountains out here. Anyone can come and use them. We used to have the ponds at uh, Memorial Park. Anyone can use it. We funded the shuttle. Anyone can use it. And so when we start saying $1.2 million and it's going to be fenced, to me that's, you know, they, I, can't, I can't get behind that. It has to be accessible. When we say, well, we're doing that because we, we're afraid animals or people are going to come and take the fruit, well, you know, that's part of life. Um, People that have their gardens in their yard, in their backyard and stuff, they have those same issues. And uh, if it's going to be a community garden paid for by community money, it needs to be available to the community. You can have a sense of uh, a lottery for who gets to actually uh, uh, take ownership of the plot for the duration of time, but then beyond that, it has to be you know, open for anyone to take their kids or their parents for a walk and get up and close to the fruit, the flowers, um, the rose garden in, in uh, Willow Glen. I mean, you don't keep people away and, and say, you know, here is $1.2 million, but it's only viewable from a distance. And so I, I really, really struggle with that. Um, so to get behind that, that needs to be open to, to the public. So now I would ask a couple questions. Uh, you know, Mr. Milks took me to the old one after it was already torn down, and we got to kind of see how it was laid out and stuff. Um, did it have a requirement that nobody could get into it, and now we've made that a requirement, the, the old one? 
No, I don't believe it did. So anybody um, could have access to it? Yeah. But, but there were internal um, internal fences that people had built it, and put up on their own. It was individually fenced. Yeah. The now, I, I'm okay with a per plot fencing, and it would be a purchasable kit that we would have in, you know, the uh, the city store, if you will, just like the uh, the soapbox derby or the uh, little balsa wood derby that the Cub Scouts do. You go, you buy the kit, and you make whatever kind uh, uh, car with those specific material. Nothing else is allowed. So you have the the kit available, and it's got the uh, the conduit uh, piping for the four corners and the mesh, and you know, it has a longevity, the mesh maybe of like two seasons, and the requirement on it by the city is that the mesh has to be replaced, uh, at, you know, each two years so that it doesn't look like a shanty town and it has to be kept up. So shifting those types of costs and, and uh, assembly stuff to the, to the people that are growing the fruits or flowers as opposed to the city doing it so the next uh, one is, I see the picture. I'm glad it's still up here because that's what I was going to ask for. I mean, it, this looks like a city park as opposed to a rural garden. And so I kind of get a little bit confused, you know. <clears throat> a, a garden has many, you know, different, you know, uh, uh, compositions, you know. You can walk down this trail and you see some creek and you walk down this trail and you see bushes and you walk down that trail and you see trees. And this is so precise. I mean, it kind of loses a little bit of the uh, rural aspect. We, we've made it so fixed and that drove up the cost too. So I would kind of ask, just I'm not um, trying to be a problem, but if you took this plot of land and you put these strips down that essentially set um, the plots, gave them a number, and the soil then uh, was up to the individual gardener. So the, the forms, if you will, just like you have for landscaping, you know, they're just two by fours. Um, uh, they're not usually not wood. They're just uh, the com composite type plastic. And put those down and say, okay, there's plot 37, there's plot 38, there's plot 39. Okay, now some gardeners will grow fruits while other gardeners will grow flowers, right? Why does a flower person need any type of meshing in the soil? But that's a cost we're incurring time and time again over all these. So the one who's going to grow fruits and vegetables says, okay, he's going to move back that 12 feet of soil and put his mesh down and put the soil back. He can also choose to either use the existing soil, put it back after he puts his mesh down, or move it over to the, to the soil pile and take compost or, or the uh, nice planter soil that's going to bear good fruit and use that. Again, leaving the cost to the person that wants to, to take ownership of this rather than you know, making this filet mignon and saying, now come and plant your seeds. You know, we've kind of really taken the, the sense of, of gardening and turned it into a, 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 a seed poking activity. And well, it, it's beautiful, but it's $1.2 million of the community's money. So John, I think the mesh under the whole garden is because they want to keep the rodents from coming up from underneath and getting into the beds from the top. So just putting it underneath each bed is not sufficient. Well, um, it's it an is additional. for that plot, and then if they put the screen over the top of the plot, because you have to do both. True, true, yeah. Right, okay. You know, so um, I struggle with $1.2 million. Um, I really want to see gardens for the community to be able to participate in. I realize there's a very uh, finite number of uh, people that can actually take the ownership and do the plots, but the whole community should be able to get in and up close and actually talk to the people that are gardening in there on any particular weekend rather than being outside, you know, looking in. 
they can walk in there and if the gardener wants to tell them you know what he is planting how how successful he's been um, what the weather does to it and things like that you know it's a very interactive well, yeah I, I think the concern is not to have people going through there when there's no gardeners around not at night or when you know you know just to prevent vandalism and, and we could do something like but that's, but lo that's lock it I'm after dark at a and um Somebody that wants to walk through that's not a gardener could check out uh, yeah. access key or I don't know how the gate's going to be, if it's going to be a code or a key. Um, I mean, there's ways you can get, allow the public in and still prevent people from pilfering the fruit or vandalizing things. Um, but just keeping it open all the time, I mean, yeah, that I don't think that works. And I look at the gardens down on Blaney near the San Jose Library on Rainbow and Blaney, and I and that's all fenced in. You can't, you know, you can't just walk through and take things. You you have to be renting a plot there in order to get in. Um, so that one is very small, so you can actually see everything from the sidewalk. So. Yes, I have a question with regarding the cost. You keep saying that um, because it's a preserve. That's why it's so costly. Mm -hmm. So if we, let's say we kind of like the one next to San Jose Library, it's, it's just an empty lot. And now we are turning that into a garden. Would that be only $1,500 per box instead of 10,000 per box, what we are looking at right now? It's because of preserve, why is that so expensive? So you have intrinsic costs that, that drive up the price f for this location. Number one, you're putting in the wire mesh underneath the entire site because you have a lot of um, animal activity. Um, we're building the fences, the perimeter fences, down three feet in order to keep animals from burrowing under. That's an additional cost that you most normally would not expect to incur because of you're in an, a more urban setting or a setting where there's not as many animals. So. We're trying to bulletproof this thing because it, it makes no sense to invest less money and then have it be unsuccessful. Meaning, mm -hmm. gardeners garden in here and right before harvest day, the animals come in and eat all their fruit or all their vegetables yeah. and they get nothing. So um, that was one of the primary concerns that they voiced early on was whatever you do, make sure you, you try to keep the rodents out. You have to deter them. We actually shrunk the footprint of the garden to keep it away from other structures, overhanging trees. Um, we've pulled in anything that could be used as a climb assist for the squirrels to get over the fence. Um, we're trying to keep the gophers out or anything else that burrows out from under. Um, and the thought was if they penetrate the perimeter, then at least you have the hardware cloth underneath that keeps them from, from coming through. If you allow them to put um, mesh underneath each box, that provides a second layer of defense. Um, with the raised boxes, it's harder for some animals to get in. Um, again, if we provide design guidelines that um, you know the gardeners would have to adhere to to cover their box, that might be a solution. So we set the design standards, and if they want to, then they could build a structure over their box um, that would take care of the birds, that could take care of any other rodent that gets into the into the garden. Yeah. So that might be a solution. That might make sense, but then I. So in case we identify, say, a part of a neighborhood park that's um, big enough, would, then that we would not need to install all this rodent control for those? Yes, for instance, in, in Mountain View, they just recently built a, a so community this one. garden. So like this one is exactly. uh, in an urban setting, so it's yes. much so, cheaper? So they decided not to put in the hardware cloth underneath the pathways or the boxes. They were thinking so that maybe that's the wrong location we are looking at for community garden. <laughs> well, this is like the food court in the middle of a nature preserve. I mean, you have people growing all different kinds of food. Um, all different kinds of animals are attracted to it. Um, I mean, hmm. it's, it's hard to deter the pests because this is where the food's going to be. So okay. they're going to be attracted to it. And we're trying our best just to to make okay. sure that everything's so protected. One more thing about the gate. So we have, I mean, I don't need, so the gate, I guess if we just use uh, the, the parameter, uh, 
one thing is you we want we want to keep the rodent out, right? So the entrance, you said you are afraid people won't close it. There is a way that maybe if it's not closed, uh, it will beep, right? You just it mm -hmm. it doesn't it doesn't complete the circuit. It alarm will sound yes. people if someone we, forgets. We would most likely put it on some sort of spring assist, so it would automatically close as soon as you let it let yeah, go. Yeah, so that's so not it would automatically really an shut issue. and not be an issue. Yeah, um, and then then it's a matter of maybe each individual garden gardener can do their own fencing. Okay, um, um, if if I may. Um, I'd like to try to clarify to be, be really clear on what, the, you know, our purpose tonight was to get feedback on the design and I appreciate all the great feedback. Um, our suggestion then would be to ensure that the, the garden is open to the public. Mm -hmm. However, if down the road we find that there are theft issues, then we should address them at that time. Um, we'll look at a spring hinged gate to ensure that it will close on its own, perhaps electronic, so that we could get some kind of a notice if it's still open or be able to control it um, so that once it's closed at 10 o'clock at night, say it, it, it's closed and the, the keys or the codes don't work. We'll look at purchasing particular kits for the exterior fencing that the gardeners are able to purchase and, and use, but we'll be restrictive to ensure that that's the only uh, only ones. Um, I think those are what I'm hearing would be the most important, most salient items. So, so I think the other item, and I'm just speaking from my own experience in building these um, for the um, for the screening, is that when you build them, um, I mean, what I did, the four by fours are higher, and you like have panels with mesh that hang on to mm -hmm. the Four, that hang on all four sides and go across the top. You can't get in any other way. Um, you, um, but the panels are easily removable. Oh, but you got. Good. But when you design the original box, you have to prepare for that. It's a lot harder to put in such a kit after the fact because you um, you don't have anything yeah. to attach it to. Basically, mm -hmm. uh, I wish I had pictures of what I had done. Because yeah, I mean, because my thought. Without that, there was no point in doing a garden because the birds would eat everything. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah. And occasionally a bird has managed to get in and, and then get stuck there. I have to take a panel out. I don't know how they got in. but uh, okay. um, So I would just say, you know, if we eliminated the mesh underneath but had ways for everyone to put on the covers if they, if they so chose to do so and paid for them and when their lease was up and they could, the next gardener could say, hey, I, you know, I want to buy these from you or whatever. Um, okay, extending the four by fours would be relatively easy. And right, sure and that's cheap, be, yeah. Th there is a kind of an economy that goes with it, but I, I'm not sure that it's overly expensive. Right, I mean, yeah, just think in advance of how you would have a kit that doesn't look tacky. Because, mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I have seen some screened in things um, like over at West Valley Community Services, I think they had some mm -hmm. uh, garden boxes, and and the screening in lo looks pretty terrible out there, and it's in front as well. And I guess I just tack onto that that um, you know we could say it sounds to me like if we actually just stapled in cloth, hardware cloth, to the bottom of these boxes avoided having to screen the entire area, we may be better off from a cost perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I agree, because people are gonna wanna put in the covers anyway, so. So then let people put in a cover, and one cover could be cover for that's just bird safe, right, to keep the birds out. Another cover could offer more security if you really wanted to keep out gophers, and there are some combined designs that I've been looking at here on the web, but I think not having to go excavate a foot down ought to save you a lot of money. It, it would save a significant amount of money. And the other thing is, I mean, I agree with Stephen that we don't want to encourage vandalism. So if we said the garden is open from, you know, by a, a timed lock, an hour prior to, it's open from dawn until an hour after sunset, 
and we had it on some automatic mm -hmm. yeah. timer based on, you know, it's the same stuff that for $89 turns my front lawn lighting on. We don't have to get too elaborate. Um, but yeah, it does monitor. We want to probably remotely monitor, make sure the thing is is secured. But um, and maybe you have a double gate system if you're worried about things coming in. But I, I I think some combination of these measures, just screening underneath each, you know, stapling in the, the small stuff under each box um, at ground level, and you know. Having a couple of options, maybe it is extending the four by fours. I wouldn't be that prescriptive with you necessarily, but offering folks a way to secure either with a hard fence, hard mesh, or with a, just a bird mesh, I, I would think we ought, we could do a lot of good here for substantially less money. And I would like to see us take those savings and put them into community gardens uh, elsewhere in the city. Because I think if you have to drive across town to get to the garden, uh, yeah, it's it's kind of mm -hmm. a hassle, right? So it, it'd be nice to have community gardens sprinkled around. If that means we can afford fewer boxes here, to, in my mind, so be it. So, okay. so would the consultant costs go down if we didn't put the mesh under the entire thing? Because I, I kind of agree with the vice mayor. I mean, maybe you're being overcautious with the $100,000, and it really wouldn't be that much well, you just don't want to come back for here's, more here's what's going to happen Stephen the consultants that bid on this project are going to review the presentation and the slide tonight yeah now, you can be damn sure that they're going to come in around a hundred thousand that's <laughs> what we budgeted no it happens all the time okay so, one more question regarding the storage for tools for the gardeners I remember they always have a a bag of compost and their gardening tools in their in their gated, uh, fenced-in garden lot before. So how are they going to put their tools? I guess if we have the compartmentalized, uh, like five lots, they might have some space within their individual compartments. But now, it will, if it's a one open area. I thought there's sheds for this. It, exactly. There will be four so sheds for um, they will each co communal have tools. Um, we will be working directly with the gardeners as, as far as the operation goes. So we want to ensure that there's only very particular kinds of things that are brought into the plots. Uh, and so we'll be working individually so with them. It's an operational not, there question. There is no space to store their personal tools or a bag of soil they want to that would have to be in their own raised bed area mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um, if I can now touch on those uh, satellite uh, gardens um, a similar type of, of thinking that if we're going to take city money and say um, you know twenty thousand dollars for a uh, garden plot that's going to be somewhere you know, I think we need to have, you know, staff telling us, you know, what's a general framework for the rules. Mm -hmm. If it's going to be city money, then it's got to be accessible to the city. If it's going to be city money, it's got to, um, and it's going to be on a church site or uh, an individual's property versus a city park, you know, it has to adhere to these things. We're not here subsidizing landscaping you know, for some entity. So if they apply for uh, a community garden and it's going to be on their piece of land, let's say a church or even a shopping center, then it has to be accessible. It has to, you know, the, the person that's going to get to garden there has got to be somehow um, chosen at random or at least within a, a group. If it's not the entire city, because again, you're going to wind up with the possibility of somebody saying, well, I'll go get the grant for the $20,000 and set up my, my garden and call it a community garden. And so we really need to know what are these ground rules for these uh, satellite sites. Now, if we say that they're only going to be on city property, that's fine. 
that's much easier for us to say, okay, the uh, gardeners are going to be chosen at random. The access is going to uh, adhere to our regular parks. Anybody can go to the playground at the park. Anybody can shoot baskets at the park. Anybody can, you know, go and walk around. So it may be screened more and stuff. Um, but uh, I think we do need to, you know, if we're going to actually, uh, in at the future time, talk about, okay, we're approving this for this amount of money. We do need to know what those rules are going to be. So I kind of uh, would like that kind of at the next session, because I think it will take a couple iterations to get to some rules that um, we all feel comfortable with. So Exactly, and our purpose, our plan is to come back to council with draft opportunities after we engage the Parks and Recreation right. Commission. So, so let me, this agenda item, where it was to review it and provide input, and I think we've done that mm -hmm. in vast quantities. Um, <laughs> So I'm not sure how much longer, I know three of us are going to the League of Cities conference tomorrow, four of us on the dais, and so I think we provided sufficient input and you guys can come back um, and consider what we've said and if it's practical and reasonable and including the concerns about, about the cost. I mean, I don't know how long it will take you, um, probably not by next meeting, but maybe the meeting after that. Um, but thank you for all the work that you've done to move this along. I mean, by all means, I, I think we're all committed to some type of community garden without a doubt. Tell the, tell the gardeners that are out there, it is coming, but we do need to come up with something that's comfortable and works for our view of the community. And, and, I, and I think, you know, it is a lot of money per plot, but and not everyone in the community uses every service that the city um, city offers, and that's you know the way of all cities. So yeah, it, it's a lot, but on the other hand, you know we've spent a lot of money on things where you don't get something as nice as this. Um, yeah, unfortunately, um, we've been forced to spend money on things that we would rather have not had. I've had to spend money on in the past uh, year or so, um, but that's not a reason to not do something that's so important to so many community members. Um, so can we, if we can just uh, move this. We'll do our best to bring it yeah, back as soon as possible. Bring it so back that as soon as possible. Yeah, so we don't end up in that window where we can't do it because of the um, nesting season. Otherwise, we're, right. we're gonna be stuck in the, the year long time frame. so we'll do our best. Okay. So Can I make a request that you p we put something in Cupertino theme, because I know many Boy Scouts are looking for projects, so they know some opportunities are available. Yes. Okay. So yeah, let's move on from this item. Um, there's no more oral communications, so we can have council and staff comments and future ad agenda items. Um, Ron, let's start on that side. Do you have anything for, uh, for that? No, I, I hit it the first time. Thanks. Okay. Leong? Yes. Um, so I went to the Diwali festival and it's uh, getting better and better each year. Mm, we shopped for clothes in the, a lot of um, Indian booths. Mm, and then there was also it, it, uh, Diwali luncheon. And on Monday, the 7th, I went to a Taiwanese um, 108th celebration of their nas national day. Mm. I think that's about it, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, John. <coughs> so, um, on uh, the third row, Kana had his uh, town hall, and I actually got the uh, the uh, 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 honor of being there to say a few words about Roe and introduce him. And so, uh, to me, that was a, a highlight. I think we're very fortunate to have him representing our, our district. On 10-7, there was the commissioner's uh, 
uh, appreciation dinner. Uh, again, I think it's very important to uh, recognize the commissioners that are volunteering their time for the betterment of our community. And without them, um, we would have to either pay for a lot of the analysis type work or, or just not have it. And we have this being done by community members. So I thought that was great. And then the uh, Diwali Festival, I think that was great. Um, Vice Mayor Chow, I think, characterized it very well when she said each year it gets bigger and bigger and better and better. And I think if, if that is how uh, we uh, improve our festivals and community events, to me that's just a great thing. So uh, those were the highlights for uh, the last couple of weeks. Okay, Darcy. Um, I, I would just add to that we did have a uh, block leader meeting on October 3rd and I think that our uh, environmental um, employees, related employees in the uh, department are uh, to be commended for putting on an excellent block leader meeting. Uh, they led the discussion and had some very active um, uh, activities in terms of uh, engaging the group and uh, giving us a lot of information about the environmental uh, measures that the city is taking. So uh, it was a really good block leader meeting. On um, October 2nd, uh, the Silicon Valley Leadership Group invited um, me as well as our uh, city manager to attend a local government day. Um, and that was attended by a couple of council members from Sunnyvale as well as myself and uh, some members of SVLG. So that was a good uh, opportunity to interact with members of the business community. Uh, and moderating the discussion was the, the head of the organization, uh, Carl Gordino. Um, we had an audit committee subcommittee meeting um, with Chair uh, Eno Schmidt and myself on October 4th to talk about uh, various ways that the Cupertino budget could be uh, perhaps getting some uh, information from neighboring jurisdictions as to some of their practices. So uh, we formed a subcommittee to talk about that and um, also attended a few of the other items that have been uh, mentioned by other council members. So uh, those uh, don't really bear repeating. Oh, thanks very much. Hey, great. So I also went to the commissioner's dinner, always a great event. Um, went to the Rokana event. I did go to Diwali after I rode in the Tournament of Bands Parade. And that was the 49th annual Tournament of Bands. Next year will be the 50th. Um, hopefully we cannot have big events on the same day. I think Diwali, I, w I wish it had been the following weekend instead. I know Diwali doesn't happen, I think, until the end of October. Um, so it would be great if we could kind of coordinate these big, big events um, between the different organizations. Um, I was impressed with Diwali because, as someone said, there was a lot of really good booths there. Uh, some other festivals I've been to, it's a, you know, a collection of um, people selling insurance or cable TV or after school tutoring, but this was actually some really interesting uh, stuff. And then on Friday, I went to the Public Safety Commission Safety Forum some good information from the fire chief from Captain Urena and how to administer Narcan. They gave out Narcan kits. Uh, good event. Uh, it was not as well attended as I would have wished. Um, uh, may maybe a Friday night is not a good night for that. I'm not sure. But they did have really good food catered by um, Stein's Beer Garden. Maybe they didn't publicize the uh, free food enough to get more people. And yeah, I think that's all I have. I missed something. So on the 4th of October, I attended a, a tour by the Valley Water District for elected official and the city staff also. They took us around the various projects that they have. And it's a very informative uh, tour. So actually, um, they, 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 there were planning commissioners from other cities also attending. Um, we, a lot of uh, federal dollars are funding, but then they also will be putting on ballot major to fund some water infrastructure work uh, next year. Okay. Thank you. And then on the 11th, we had our first coffee talk on 
So this will be a monthly event, Friday morning from 8.30 to 9.30. Um, we had um, a full table of uh, residents, uh, multiple issues. It was nice to sit down and some residents said that it was nice to list here what other people uh, have, what concerns other people have. So we had all kinds of different in issues. Um, people brought up, for example, their parking space near their home. Um, there were issues with uh, parking space might be taken away, and then we were drawing a map to see how we can find alternative solutions, and then the McClellan ran, uh, road bike path, how that affect uh, some the traffic of some area, and different issues. The next one will be November, I think, 5th? Um, like first, yeah. So there is a flyer of um, dates for, for this monthly event, but I did get a comment from in a Diwali festival. Someone said they couldn't make it a Friday morning. So I guess we have to think about a lunch meeting or weekday nights and in the future. We'll, we'll have an outreach banquet. <laughs> <laughs> and then on the 5th of October, sorry, I attended a cybersecurity symposium held in the county office. So they are talking about how the different cities are preparing their cyber security infrastructure to have a security operation center in case of ransomware or any cyber attack. And then I spoke to Bill afterwards to understand how our cities are prepared. Sounds like he is all on top of it. And then I also attended another meeting where I learned that San Mateo County has something called the Innovation Lab, that they are implementing a lot of smart city pilot projects all over San Mateo County. And then they also work with individual cities to identify different projects. So one particular project that I am thinking will be maybe air quality sensors near um, Lehigh Cement. And also maybe possibly cameras that can identify bicycle accidents or near misses that, so that it can help with public safety. And the bill also mentioned there is some technology we can actually capture license plate going in and out a certain area. So it doesn't capture people's faces, so it's less uh, privacy intruding, but then maybe that could help with public safety in the future. That's, there are more many things that we could look at. Okay, so, anything from staff? Uh, oh, one, Just oh, one that I, I forgot when we were talking about the Linda Vista Trail. After we talked about it at the previous council meeting, I got at least three, possibly four emails from residents that live along the trail that w had concerns. And so the question that I forgot to ask is, you know, have all the residents along the Linda Vista Trail been notified that it is going to be an open trail? And for the residents that had concerns, I unfortunately didn't directly save those emails. Um, because they were just kind of random in terms of time. They, didn't, they weren't coming in regularly right after the event. But the fact that there are at least three, possibly four people along the trail with concerns, and now we're saying we are moving forward, I'd like to know that the residents with concerns have, been, uh, have met with the city staff and somehow that that's been... Uh, 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 worked out to the best that it can be and let us know that the outreach has been done and to what degree so yeah no that's fair uh, Chad had a community uh, had a meeting with the 17 uh, parcel owners that abut the property last week not all 17 showed up but he has had contact communication with all 17 to date and we're working through any issues that they have let us know if there's any residents that have an issue that have not been, not that it can be, but that it has not been. So at least we're aware of it when we are saying, okay, open the gate and let it happen that um, we know the status. We could do that. 
So are there any I just want to uh, add the coffee talk will be second Friday of every month. And I think Darcy has a town hall meeting coming up. Um, yeah, and Mayor, I, I did have one comment as well. Okay, great. Staff comments. Yes, no more for, council comments. All right. For the, <laughs> um, for the community gardens, by us taking this back, we will definitely miss the nesting season. Um, it, would, it would be preferred. I mean, we got your feedback. We appreciate that. It would be preferred for us to proceed with, with the design, incorporate all the feedback that we heard, and, and I kept a you know, very good listing of that, and, and us to be able to proceed to go to bid by November 4th to be able to have a chance to hit, to get the work started prior to the nesting season. And we can report back to you, you know, when we complete the design and what the estimated cost savings are, we can do all that prior to November 4th, but it would be very advantageous for the project to be able to hit that date and keep going forward. So you can get bids, but without our commitment to go and actually well, I'd, we, we would advise council uh, exactly what, what uh, additional cost savings we implemented, what we expect those savings to be, and that that would be incorporated in the design. Well, that you know, this is the prior agenda item, and we've moved on. Right. I think the right way to work this is that the city manager should be meeting with individual council members to see if it's appropriate to bring this back at this point, right? Okay. We can you, need a, you need a consensus of the council to move forward, and, and the city manager ought to be managing... To so decide to queue when when it's ready. To right. So that. when is our next meeting? November what? November fifth. Okay. So I will. I'll work. I mean, out. we could we could have a meeting October 29th if if need be, just for this item. I'll I'll work it out. Okay. And maybe I mean, maybe that's true. Yeah, I don't like having a third meeting, but mm -hmm. um, I think this is of concern to enough people that it might warrant it. Okay. And then just a short report on the PSPS. Um, we had about 3,300 of our homes are um, in the community affected by that shutdown. Um, it was an arduous task to work through PG&E at this point, very difficult. However, I felt like our staff and our set of Citizen Corps volunteers did a great job of putting notifications literally on everybody's front door in two different languages uh, during key portions so they had instructions of what to do if their house should be affected by the shutdown. Um, and then we did conducted a lessons learned. Um, it was it this week, yesterday, today. Uh, and we'll get some results out of that as well. Um, so just, just an update on that. We did have homes affected by that on the west side. You know, I, wanna, I wanna commend you for coordinating that and working with staff and our volunteers to get that done. Um, because it's not as if the utility gave us a whole lot of lead time in order to uh, notify our residents. So I, I was actually there in City Hall when you were um, co both contemplating and in the process of getting that uh, completed and executed uh, on the day before all of this was happening. So that, that, was, that was an amazing effort, you know. I think each one of us having canvassed this entire city uh, multiple times can say, yes, that, that was pretty impressive to be able to reach out to a good 20% of our households or more uh, in such a very brief period of time. So yeah. thank you for doing that. Okay. And yeah. I understand that the staff reach out to certain residences three times, mm -hmm. two times, three times, when they are not at home. And thank you. So Great. Okay. If that's it, adjourn.